So how's our commissioner this morning? Very well, Representative. Thank you. Judy, a lot She's been chasing. She's been chasing the sea eagle. Yeah. What have I been chasing? Oh, yeah. We're going to have to figure it out. A lot of background noise, Judy. When you come up. I know we're trying to figure that out. Yeah, Senator. I believe Joe, it's we're because live. people aren't muted. Yeah, live. Yes. Okay. okay. Let's try. We're, it. Li we're live, folks. So. How's that? Better? No. Nope. Still got some feedback. Any better now? Good. Yes. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. No. Nope. All right. Nope. We live. Again, Linda. We all set. We are live. Okay. Oh, good morning again, everyone. Uh, I'm Senator Jim Dill, chair of the IFNW committee. And the committee's here. We uh, already introduced ourselves to each other, evidently. So uh, since we weren't live, but uh, we won't bother to go around and do that again. And uh, Linda just left, but I would also introduce our analyst uh, who is new to us this year, this year is Julia McDonald. Good morning, Julia. Good morning, thank you. And Linda Lercore is our returning clerk and she just got up and ran away. I hope nothing is off again here. We're having a few de technical difficulties this morning, but we'll get them all worked out. And what we're having to do today is we're going to have several presentations from uh, the department. And then we've got a few status updates. So we're probably gonna have a fairly long day um, we're going to start out with um, the antlerous deer discussion, followed by the crossbow discussion, then electronic tagging. So two and three are switched around if any of you have the calendar in front of you. Then we'll go down and uh, have a presentation on uh, hunting dogs and civil trespass. And then finally, the final presentation before the status updates is on the bear season. So with that, we'll go right ahead and we'll start out with an act to allow Commissioner of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife to authorize the hunting of antlers deer without a permit in certain areas. So with that, who is presenting? Nathan Bieber? Linda, you have is he out in the waiting room? Do we have him yet? I don't see him. <clears throat> Um, all of our presenters today will be are at the MDIFW. Okay, duty. So they need to be brought in. They're still in the waiting room. Promoting it now. There. Okay, I see the letters down there. Good morning. We see you, Nate. Can you see us? Yes. There we go. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Introduce, introduce yourself, please. Yes, I am Nathan Bieber, the deer specialist with the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. Good morning. Good morning. I just need to figure out how to share here. Good. Yep. Good morning, Senator Dale, Representative Landry, and honorable members of the Inland Fisheries and Wildlife Committee. I am Nathan Bieber, Deer Specialist with the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. I'm here to provide a report back on antlerless deer permit system recommendations resulting 
from discussions related to LD116, an act to allow the Commissioner of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife to authorize the hunting of antlerless deer without a permit in certain areas. This bill was carried over from the first regular session of the 130th Maine Legislature with the request that IFNW convene a stakeholder group to assist in reviewing the antlerless deer permit system and to report back with recommendations for how to improve the department's ability to meet deer management objectives while providing a transparent, fair, and equitable system for allocating antlerless harvest opportunity. Additionally, IFNW is asked to examine methods of generating revenue with the system to be used to fund efforts to protect and manage deer wintering areas. Have you seen the first slide here? Okay. See the first one, yes. Just, it's just the title though. <clears throat> By now. Yep. Great. Overview. Yep. Thank you. In this presentation, I'll first go over some background information on our deer permit system, and I'll discuss why it is that we're in a position where we're needing to reevaluate our system right now. I'll then go through the process that we use to reevaluate our deer permit system, and I'll finish up by talking about some recommended changes that we've developed and the justifications for those recommended changes. Our primary means of regulating the deer population in Maine is by regulating the number of does that are harvested each year. We have since 1986 and are still presently using the any deer permit system. I'm gonna to refer to that as the ADP system for the rest of this presentation. Using this history, uh, the system, we have a lottery that hunters are able to apply to. And if they're successful in that lottery, they'll receive an any deer permit. If they have that any deer permit, then they have the authority with their regular hunting license to take a buck anywhere in the state, or they can use their any deer permit to take an antlerless deer in a designated district or subunit. This system has been in place since 1986. If a hunter does not possess an any deer permit, then they just have the authority to take a buck statewide on their regular license. We also do issue some bonus permits every year, and those are made available in districts where there are more permits available than there are applicants for those permits. Now this system worked pretty well early on. Over years as we've under harvested does increasingly, we've seen that our doe harvests have been on average a little over 20% below objective over the last decade and going back a little further than that even still. And a big reason for this is that we make compensatory adjustments every year for under harvest of does. So if one year we're intending to harvest 500 does in a district and we only harvest 400, we'll try to compensate for that in the following year by issuing more permits and allowing more doe harvest. So what's happened over time then is at some point we fell behind where we were under harvesting does and this happened repeatedly year after year and permit numbers started ballooning to the point where we were issuing far more permits in some districts and experiencing very severely diminishing returns on those permits. If you look at some of our districts, for example, there may be very little functional difference in issuing 10,000 permits or 20,000 permits because every hunter that wants one is getting one. And then after that point, you're just stacking permits on those same hunters. And it's very few of our successful main deer hunters that are taking more than one deer. It's about 90% of our successful deer hunters that take one deer and then about 8% take two deer, very few people take more than that. So when you stack permits on hunters, you lose the effectiveness of those additional permits. In May of 2021, in response to three bills related to antlers harvest, this committee asked our department to convene a stakeholder group to review our system and look for a better path forward to improve our ability to harvest the number of does that we want to each year. Specifically, we were sent a letter and charged with the following. In reviewing the analyst deer permit system, the stakeholder group should consider recommending changes that will allow the department to continue to meet deer management objectives while also providing a transparent system that has some predictability and equitable access for hunting opportunities. The stakeholder group may also consider recommending changes that will allow for increased participation in deer hunting by specific groups such as youth hunters. 
In addition, examine restructuring the OS deer permit system to identify potential revenue sources to fund efforts to protect deer wintering areas. <laughs> to summarize the issues that we're facing then, we're currently unable to achieve desired levels of doe harvest using ADP in central and southern Maine. Issuing ADP works fine in lower deer density areas or in these areas we don't care quite so much about under harvest of does since we're trying to increase the population there. But once you get to a point in a district where you're issuing more permits than you have applicants, you start to see very severely diminishing returns on those extra permits that you issue. Now hunters that receive an any deer permit, they're faced with a choice of taking a buck or a doe. And in a lot of areas of the state, particularly those areas that have a lot of deer, if a hunter decides to wait for a buck, he can have a pretty reasonable confidence level that he will see a buck. So a lot of them are gonna wait for that buck and they're not gonna use that permit to take an animal this year. In some of our districts as well, we're issuing multiple bonus permits per, hunters, uh, per hunter and we're still not able to achieve the level of doe harvest that's desired in those areas. If you look at a district like 25, for example, this past year, some of those folks had two and three bonus permits apiece and we were still not able to achieve the desired level of doe harvest. And then part of that is because our lottery only reaches a little over half of our hunters. It's about 55% of our deer hunters in Maine that apply in the lottery. So that leaves 45% of our deer hunters that are not applying in the lottery and don't have any sort of permit to take an antlerless deer. So that's a lot of antlerless harvest potential that we're not currently tapping into. The process that we went through to gather information and develop recommendations is as follows. We sort of kick things off in the spring with our any deer permit meetings that we hold every year. We meet in the spring every year to talk about how many permits to recommend in each district and other deer management issues that are cropping up or creeping up in each of the different regions. So I'll meet individually with each of our seven IFNW regions to discuss districts in their area and then we'll come together in a bigger any deer permit meeting. And so we use this as an opportunity this year to talk about some of the different options that we might have in front of us and talk about what we thought might work, what we thought might be best accepted. We've then also held a number of other internal meetings and discussions on this, not only this past year in relation to this bill, but also in years prior as we've, as we've seen our doe harvests continually not quite stack up to our objectives. I also did a brief review of what's going on in other Northeast jurisdictions for antlerless harvest so that I could present that information to our stakeholder group and allow them to have quick access to what's going on in, in neighboring jurisdictions. And then we also held two stakeholder meetings where information was presented and discussions were uh, developed and um, tried to generate consensus in those meetings as well on some of those uh, proposal items. We agreed at the outset that any solution we would come up with would have sort of these common principles and uh, uh, these principles in common. In particular, anything we would come up with would need to improve our ability to meet doe harvest objectives in our different districts. Additionally, whatever we come up with should not negatively impact buck hunting opportunities. A lot of our main hunters are buck hunters and they want to continue hunting bucks and aren't that interested in antlerless hunting. So we didn't want to negatively impact their ability to keep doing that. We wanted to avoid creating major shifts in effort on the landscape, hunting effort. We want to avoid creating complicated system components and avoid changing things that are already working well and well understood by our hunters. We wanted to make sure that we were creating a fair and equitable system for allocating opportunity. And lastly, we wanted to improve our ability to recruit, retain and reactivate main deer hunters. So the recommendations that we've developed are gonna be broken down into five broad categories. Methods for achieving doe harvest objectives, permit lottery, permit fees, youth day, and archery and crossbow hunting. Our first proposal relates to methods for achieving doe harvest objectives. And we propose that we allocate permitted antlerless harvest opportunity by issuing antlerless permits instead of any deer permits statewide. An antlerless permit would allow anyone who receives it to take an additional antlerless deer. This would eliminate the choice that some hunters are faced with where they have to choose between taking a buck or an antlerless deer. And this is a choice that our current any deer permit holders have to make. This would increase the permit fill rate and the willingness of folks to use the permits that they receive on antlerless deer. 
And it may also encourage some of our hunters that didn't bother to apply for an any deer permit previously to apply and to participate in the lottery if they knew that the permit that they'd be getting would let them take an additional antlerless deer. This would, however, result in lower numbers of permits being issued overall, which would lower lottery odds a bit. In some districts, you'd still be 100% likely to get a permit as you are currently, but in most districts, your likelihood would go down by about 30 to 40%. For example, your odds going down to 50% uh, chance to get a permit down to 30, not 50 to 10. So 40% 40, 40 decline in your likelihood of getting a permit. Our second proposal is what was in LD116, and this is that we be granted the authority to designate some districts as open to either sex hunting on a regular license. As I mentioned, it's just over half of our deer hunters that apply for a permit in the lottery. And so if some of these other changes that we're gonna be recommending don't get us to where we wanna be in terms of antlers harvest, this would allow us then to tap into those 45% of hunters who do not apply in the lottery by giving them by default the option of taking an antlerless deer on their regular license. So in this situation, you could still apply in the lottery and get an antlerless permit, but if you chose not to, on your regular license in a designated district, you could take a buck or an antlerless deer. In terms of the permit lottery, we propose limiting applicants to selecting two preferred WMDs or subunits for their permit. Currently, when you apply in the lottery, you're able to select three districts that you'd be interested in getting a permit in, uh, an any deer permit, and then also two districts for a bonus permit. By reducing choice here a little bit down to two districts, this would increase the likelihood that hunters are gonna be applying for districts where they are likely to hunt. Currently, it's about 70% of our any deer applicants that do utilize the privilege or the opportunity to select three districts when they're choosing where they'd like their permit to be. And once you get to that third choice, your likelihood of actually being interested in hunting there has decreased by quite a bit. So if we limit that choice to two districts, we're gonna be more likely to get hunters that really wanna hunt there and really wanna take an animal list deer there. We also propose eliminating the permit swaps and transfers that we currently have. This will limit the ability of hunters to collect permits beyond what they're actually likely to use and it will disincentivize hunters applying for districts where they're not actually likely to hunt with the hope that they can use them later on to swap with someone and get a district that they are more interested in hunting in. So it also alleviate a major administrative and law enforcement burden that we currently see with swaps and transfers. They have to be processed during the season. So administratively you're processing eight or 900 um, transfers and several hundred swaps as well. And that's also difficult for our law enforcement in the field to keep up with who actually possesses which permits when they're being transferred and swapped between hunters. And lastly, sort of an, a more of an accounting sort of proposal. Currently in any district where there are 3,500 or more permits, we allocate 2.5% of those as super PAC permits. Uh, we propose lowering this down to 2000 since if we switch to antlerless or from any deer permits to antlerless permits, we'll be issuing far fewer permits. And so this um, threshold should be lowered and this will just ensure that it's basically the same districts that currently get super PAC permits would continue to be the same districts that would get super PAC permits with the switch to antlerless permits. On permit fees, we have two proposals. Our first is that we charge a $12 fee for each permit that is received by the lottery with a $2 agent fee. This would place an appropriate value on permits allowing for the take of a second deer. So all the permits that we issue in the lottery now would be for an additional deer. You're not paying for the opportunity to take a buck or a doe on an any deer permit, but you're paying for the opportunity to take a second deer. And this would attach an appropriate value to that second animal. This would also increase the likelihood that a permit applicant is serious about taking an antlerless deer if they are willing to pay a permit fee associated with the opportunity to take that antlerless deer. This permit fee amount is consistent with our current expanded archery antlerless permit fee of $12. And the revenue generated could uh, potentially generate funds for the deer management fund and efforts to acquire and manage deer wintering areas in Northern, Western and Eastern Maine. 
We also propose distributing excess permits over the counter for $12 plus a $2 agent fee. Currently what we do is if we have more permits than applicants in a district, the leftover permits are distributed in, in additional lottery rounds as bonus permits, allowing for the take of an additional antlerless deer. Rather than distribute these leftover permits and additional lottery rounds, we propose selling them over the counter for the same $12 fee and the $2 agent fee. This would provide opportunities to acquire permits for those applica applicants that are not successful in the lottery or they don't participate in the lottery. Also, if a hunter does get a permit in the lottery and they use it and decide they are interested in making that intentional choice to get back out there and try to take another antlerless deer, they'd have the opportunity then to purchase one of these permits and use it to take another antlerless deer. And similar to the previous proposal, this would generate income for the deer management fund and efforts to acquire and manage deer wintering areas in Northern, Western and Eastern Maine. With an estimate of the number of permits that will be available every year, if they were made available at this $12 price point, this would be approximately $750,000 per year to go towards acquiring and managing deer wintering habitat. Now I'd like to mention that of the proposals that we've developed in our stakeholder process, most of them were very well received and agreed upon. Fees was the one where there was quite a bit of disagreement. And the stated reasons for opposition included that the permits have historically been free and so they should remain free. Permit fees may be counterproductive if we're trying to encourage people to get out there and hunt for does. And there was also some thought that a hunting lease cost increase might be better than creating a new fee altogether. Now a proposal on Youth Day. We would propose being granted the authority to designate which districts will allow either sex hunting without a permit on youth day, rather than coupling this with the issuance of permits. Currently the way it works is if a district has any deer permits issued within it, then any youth hunters on youth day in that district can take an antlerless deer without a permit. So the two things are tied together right now, the issuance of permits and youth hunters being able to take an antlerless deer without a permit. We would initially use this, this authority to allow youth hunters to take an antlerless deer without a permit in all districts, so statewide. This continues to prioritize youth hunting opportunities and makes the regulations a little bit more simple and that hunters aren't needing to keep track of which districts they're allowed to have their kid take an antlerless deer without a permit. It would just be statewide. And this also eliminates some situations where we're sort of faced with weighing youth hunting versus uh, regular applicants in some districts where it's sort of a razor thin margin in terms of doe harvest and we want to allow just a little bit of doe harvest. We sometimes have to weigh those two things where we're talking about issuing very small token numbers of permits just to allow youth hunters to take antlerless deer. We'd rather have these two things just be decoupled since it's sort of awkward to, to weigh those things out when we're weighing permit recommendations every year. And somewhat similarly, we would like to be granted the authority to designate which districts will allow either sex hunting without a permit during October archery. This is also currently coupled with the issuance of permits so that those districts that have permits allow antlerless harvest during October archery without a permit. We would initially designate districts 12, 13, 15 to 18, 20 to 26 and 20 and 29 as open to antlerless harvest without a permit. These would be consistent currently with the districts that allow a second week of muzzleloader hunting. A lot of this will tie in with the crossbow hunting bill that we'll be discussing later with increased crossbow use as we're proposing. We expect that more antlerless deer would be taken with crossbows and so we need to be a little bit discerning and which districts will allow our archery hunters, upright bow hunters and crossbow hunters to take an antlerless deer without a permit. This also allows us to better use the archery season and crossbows in particular as an antlerless harvest tool in those districts where we need to increase our doe harvest. And with that, we'll either take questions or jump into the next presentation. Are there any questions? Yeah, Mr. Chair. Yes, Representative Martin. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Nathan, a great uh, presentation. Question, how many districts uh, currently do not allow uh, doe permits? 
This past year it was just three districts. It tends to uh, differ a little bit between about 10 and say three. If we have a very severe winter, some of those Western districts and down East districts may not allow analyst harvest. But uh, this past year it was just three uh, districts, one, two, and four. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, if I may. Uh, Nathan, so your recommendations uh, regarding uh, 116 uh, will that change any of the current districts or, or currently allow uh, bill permits in those districts that currently do not allow them? It will not change those districts. The one thing that would change is the districts where uh, antlerless harvest is allowed without a permit during October archery. Some of those districts would be dropped off that list, whether um, District 27, for example, it's Youth Day alone there tends to produce as many does as we're trying to harvest throughout the whole season. So that's one of those really razor thin margin districts where if we allow crossbow hunters to take antlerless deer as well, we'd wanna be a little more careful about that. So that would not be a district that we would allow that further Great. or going Thank forward rather. You. Thank you so much. Other questions? Representative Lyford. Uh, thank you, Senator Dill. Yeah, very nice job on this. Um, are we trying to get this concluded so that we can apply this to this fall, Nathan? That is our hope, yes. And um, did we take into account the warden's uh, enforcement on this bill and these recommendations? We had yeah. several wardens in the stakeholder group as well as internal meetings and don't anticipate any hiccups there. Good, thank you. Other questions? Representative Landry. Uh, thank you, Nathan. That uh, looks really good. Uh, I'm very supportive of it. You did it. You did a great job. For those unaware, Representative Landry was uh, our representative on the stakeholder committee. Aha, uh -huh. now I know why then. <laughs> do we have copies of these presentations? Uh, we do. Okay, I guess I just, when I looked for them, I couldn't find them earlier, so. Um, we do have them, we don't have them. Okay, it'd be nice to have them just in the hard copy because there was a lot of information presented and if we're gonna discuss this on Wednesday. But we'll send them to you, uh, Senator Dill, this afternoon. Okay, great, thank you. Other questions? Ah, uh, yes, Representative Ordway. Yes, thank you. Uh, Nathan, you mentioned that we, you looked at other states. Just curious on how they're doing with their dome management, like in New Hampshire, maybe Vermont. When we send around the port, uh, just FYI, the information that I provided the stakeholder group on what's going on in other jurisdictions will be in there, so you'll have access to all of that. But uh, suffice to say, it varies quite a bit. As you go further south, it tends to be pretty unrestricted access to antlerless deer where anyone who wants to take one can take one. As you move further north, it tends to change quite a bit. We do have several jurisdictions and states that have a lottery like we do. And um, I believe it's Connecticut and at least one other are sort of in the same boat that we're proposing here where they distribute a first round by lottery and then the leftovers they sell over the counter. So that's a fairly common approach in the Northeast. Other questions? Seeing none, again, thank you for that excellent presentation. And next we're going to move into the presentation on electronic tagging. And this is, uh, excuse me, on crossbow, this is uh, Colonel Dan Scott. I'm moving him in now, Senator. Morning, Colonel. Welcome. Good morning, folks. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. I'll see if I can uh, get my uh, screen shared here.
How's that? Are you able to see that first slide, uh, Senator Dill? Yes, we can see the first slide. We can see actually all of them, so which is fine. Okay. But uh, we'll move through it like that. Yeah. Yeah. Try to change that. We'll run into technical errors. Um, so, uh, good morning, uh, Senator Dale, Representative Landry. I'm going, uh, and other members of the IFNW committee, I'm here to uh, provide the report back on Public Law 2019, Chapter 98, an act to allow the use of crossbow for a limited duration during the archery season on deer and the fall season on wild turkey. Um, can't see everybody. If, if during the course of it you have a question, feel free to, to speak up. So my plan is to summarize the impact the expansion of crossbow hunting over the last two years has had on participation in crossbow education courses, as well as the purchase of crossbow permits. Uh, to summarize the impact the expansion of crossbow hunting over the last two years has had on violations detected and or changes in the number of calls for service to the warden service. Um, summarize the impact of harvest rates for deer and turkey. And we also intend to provide IFNW suggestions for modifications to this law. So as you may remember, LD27, an act to allow the use of crossbows for a limited duration during the archery season, um, went into effect and did the following. For a period of three years, beginning, beginning in 2020, then also including 2021 and 22, this law allows a person to hunt deer with a crossbow during the open archery season on deer, and turkey during the fall wild turkey hunting season. It also specifies that the person who uses a crossbow during the open archery season on deer may not harvest an antlerless deer unless that person holds an, an antlerless deer permit. So as you may remember, uh, we have a, a, uh, a regular archery season during the month of October. And in the past, uh, crossbow use was prohibited um, during that time. This law, um, made it legal to use crossbows during that time. The only difference would be a person who wanted to kill an antlerless deer with a crossbow during October needed to have an antlerless deer permit where somebody with a traditional bow and arrow could still kill an antlerless deer. Uh, when this law passed, the department provided additional education to the public on these changes, which included a crossbow fact sheet to help staff and hunters navigate the complexities of the changes. Uh, there, there are multiple statutes that uh, kind of contradict um, each other, whether you're hunting with a traditional bow or a crossbow, or whether you're hunting during the firearm season, the archery season, um, or for some other big game species with crossbows. So we had to come up with a fact sheet to try to clarify that for users. The department also offered a required standalone crossbow education course that prepares hunters to utilize crossbows for hunting purposes in a safe and lawful manner. At this time, the crossbow course can be completed in person or online. In-person courses have been incorporated into many of the archery hunter education courses. As you may remember, um, this opened up crossbow hunting to anyone who previously um, held a firearms license, um, provided they took the crossbow course and we anticipated um, a large increase in, in the uh, people who wanted to obtain their crossbow permit. Um, the report back requirements is to measure the impact on the deer and turkey harvest from the use of crossbows in accordance with Title 12. Uh, was the additional use of crossbows allowed in any area where special archery hunting season on deer was established by the commissioner? Were there any issues or conflicts that arose from the additional use of crossbows? And do we have any recommendations moving forward with the use of crossbows during the regular archery deer season, um, any special archery season in the fall season on wild turkey? So a couple of things to note, um, crossbow education courses, of course, in 2019, the law hadn't taken effect yet. And as you can see, um, we had about 815 people take the in-person course for crossbow education, and we had not yet offered an online course. 2020 is the first year that the crossbow uh, bill was changed and we allowed crossbows to be used during the October archery season. Of course, it was during the pandemic, so in-person courses dropped. Um, significantly anyway, but as you can see, online participation was very, very high with over 3,500 people taking the crossbow education course in 2020 alone in response to the new law. And again, in 2021, this past year, we continue to see a decline in in-person um, classes for the crossbow education course. Of course, we're still in the midst of the pandemic. Uh, however, once again, we see very high uh, use 
in the online course, again, demonstrating that there was definitely uh, some public interest in um, taking crossbow education and potentially using uh, the taking advantage of the expanded opportunities for crossbows. Likewise, our crossbow permit sales, uh, 2019, the year before the law took effect, um, we have resident and non-resident for a total of a little over 1,100 crossbow sold in uh, sales permits, excuse me, crossbow permits sold in 2019. Once again, 2020, when the new law came into effect, most of the change was in resident uh, crossbow permit sales um, with an increase to over 3,200 uh, permits sold, um, which is almost a 300% increase. And again, in 2021, another large jump in resident crossbow permit sales. So now we're up towards of 4,300 permits sold in 2021 alone, indicating to us that um, there was definitely some, uh, a lot of interest in the ability to use crossbows the last two years. So the <clears throat> report back asked, <clears throat> excuse me, was the additional use of crossbows allowed in any area where special archery hunting season on deer was established? Uh, the expansion of crossbows was a statewide expansion. It did permit the use of crossbows in areas which overlap the expanded archery hunting zone. However, um, we're speaking about the areas where you can expand an archery hunt, but not necessarily did not expand the use of crossbows to be included in the authority of the expanded archery permit. So I know it's a little bit confusing, but um, the, the expanded archery season that we're all familiar with, we're in special designated areas across the state. Uh, if you have an expanded archery bow and arrow permit, uh, you can purchase as many antlerless deer tags as you'd like and kill antlerless deer. Uh, the crossbows did not expand to the authority of that permit. So you couldn't take your crossbow or new users couldn't now take a crossbow, go to the expanded archery area um, purchase multiple permits and shoot multiple antlerless deer. However, the area where you are permitted to hunt with crossbows during the October season does over, it is a statewide expansion. So it did overlap with the expanded archery area. Some people were confused by that. They thought that the use of crossbows was not going to be allowed in and around the expanded archery zones. Um, that, that's not the case. Um, it's just not, they're just not allowed um, under the authority of the expanded archery permit but within the zone or um, across the state, they were permitted. Uh, issues or conflicts that arose from additional use of crossbows. Um, it, is inspect, uh, it is expected that as we encounter, um, as we have more crossbows on the landscape and more crossbow opportunities on the landscape, our staff's going to encounter more violations. Um, the number of violations detected from 2019, 20, and 21 uh, was 10, 23 and 21 respectively. Uh, in many of those instances, I'll note that the crossbow itself was not the cause of the violation. That's just the implement being possessed at the, at the time. Um, so overall, the impact of warden service calls for service and violations um, really was not that significant. Uh, it, did, it did go up um, compared to the year previous. Um, it, it basically doubled. So in 2019, uh, we had 10 violations that we encountered with the use of crossbows. Um, they range from hunting over bait to uh, uh, using crossbows under the authority of their expanded archery permit, um, night hunting, shooting too close to dwellings, etc. 2020, uh, we doubled those violations up to 23, again, including hunting over bait, exceeding the bag limit, um, felons in possession of dangerous weapons, night hunting, um, killing a uh, deer with a crossbow uh, under their expanded archery permit, uh, hunting without a crossbow permit, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the number of violations did double, but overall um, only 23 total. And similarly in 2021, uh, we were up towards 21 violations, again, including hunting over bait, false registration, um, night hunting, fraudulent licenses, hunting without a crossbow permit. So number of violations, some of which you could argue um, the crossbow wasn't the cause of the violation. I mean, trespassing with a crossbow, you could presume that potentially a person would have trespassed whether they were using a traditional bow or a rifle or a crossbow. Um, some of these violations, obviously hunting without a crossbow permit, um, you know, they uh, obviously it was the effect of the new law that potentially uh, put them in violation. Um, but overall, uh, limited impact upon um, the activities of warden service. 
uh, the impact um, to the harvest of um, deer and turkeys. A uh, lot of information in this graph, but I'll just draw your attention to a couple of things. You can see on the left side, it's the years from 2014 to 2021. Um, the green uh, are traditional bow and arrow and the red is crossbow. So if uh, you draw your attention to 2019 crossbow and slide over here to the deer taken category, you can see that there was 224 deer killed um, for a total of 0.8% of the harvest in 2019. In 2020, the harvest of deer with the use of a crossbow went up to 720 and that increased the percentage of the harvest up to 2.2%. And in 2021, we had a little over 1,100 deer taken with a crossbow and that increased the harvest to 2.8%. So overall, the harvest um, from 2019 um, did increase almost the percentage of harvest, almost threefold from 0.8 to 2.2 and a little bit more than threefold from 0.8 to 2.8 in 2021. But overall, the number of deer that were taken is relatively low or insignificant um, at 1,100. Um, and similarly, with turkeys in 2019, before the law was in, in place, uh, we had 45 turkeys taken with a crossbow. Obviously, due to the pandemic, we may remember we didn't register turkeys in 2020, but in 2021, um, the percentage of the harvest was up to 1.2, which again is about um, a little bit more than double. Um, but overall, only 73 turkeys taken with a crossbow, so uh, you know, limited impact to the overall harvest. Uh, so at this point, our recommendations are we respectfully request um, and recommend to the committee that no changes be made at this time. We support the increased opportunities for crossbow and would, um, also suggest repealing the sunset provision in the current law that is scheduled to occur on January 1st, 2023 so that the current use of crossbows would remain in effect if nothing else should change. Um, in addition to that, um, the other recommendation by the department is um, we would like to present a full package of changes related to crossbows in 2023. Our intent would be um, to include crossbow in the definition of archery equipment so that the use of crossbow would expand more than it is now and be consistent with traditional bow and arrow. So now we talk about archery equipment, we talk about traditional bow and arrow and, and all the benefits um, and, and authorities that go with that. Uh, in the future, we would propose that the term archery equipment includes crossbows. Uh, there are many complexities and exceptions between the two methods of hunting, and it has become increasingly confusing for hunters and our staff to explain the differences. Um, so um, some of this is due to increased opportunity, which has been given over time. And by expanding the use of crossbow further aligns with our mission to recruit more hunters and perhaps reactivate archery hunters who have been physically unable to draw a traditional bow and arrow or under the age of 65 um, by simplifying these laws. Uh, there would definitely be some need uh, for some close scrutiny of the crossbow and archery laws to merge them together. So we would rec recommend a 2024 implementation date. So just to summarize that, leave crossbows as they are in the current um, LD right now, uh, do away with the sunset clause on January 1st, 2023. Um, during the 2023 session, we would propose uh, new laws which would merge the, um, the definition of crossbow into the definition of um, archery equipment. And we would propose a myriad of laws which would then take effect in 2024, give us a chance to educate the public and change whatever systems we needed to potentially around permits or education courses um, so that we'd be looking at um, the term archery equipment in 2024 would refer to both traditional bow and arrow and crossbows increasing overall opportunity for uh, users across the state. Uh, so I will stop sharing that. And that concludes that presentation. If anybody has any questions. Thank you, questions. Answer. Representative Alley. You're muted, Representative Alley. Ben. Yeah, I can hear you. So did I understand you right when you said that uh, crossbows was going to be allowed? Uh, uh, so that there'd be more hunters that, and, and archery than there is right now. The numbers are going to go up when they do that. 
what we would do is um, we would allow the use of crossbows in all the same areas and under the same authorities that we currently do uh, for traditional archery. Um, I would suspect that, that some of the numbers of hunters mm -hmm. may increase around archery hunting because of that. I mean, we saw a market increase in the number of folks who took the crossbow safety course and bought crossbow permits. So we would expect that that would go up, but um, the term archery equipment would include bow and arrow and crossbow if, if that package was to go through in 2023 and 24. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank Other you. questions? Wow, Colonel, looks like you're getting off easy. Thank you. You'll be hearing you. from me more today though. So. <laughs> All right. Maybe you won't be so easy next time. All right, uh, we'll move on. Thank you. We'll go back to the electronic tagging of uh, big game animals and turkey tagging. I believe it's going to be all in one presentation from what I understood from uh, the department. And uh, it appears that there may be several people presenting. I'm not sure, but uh, I guess we're back to, uh, whoops, I see uh, Nathan Webb. So it looks like he must be at least starting, if not doing the whole presentation. When you're ready, Nathan, you can unmute yourself. Okay, I'm gonna turn over to Dr. Craig McLaughlin for the presentation. Okay. So just this okay. Good morning. Good morning. So proceed when you are ready. Okay, good morning, uh, Senator Dill, Representative Landry, and honorable members of the Inland Fisheries and Wildlife Committee. I'm Craig McLaughlin, the Research and Assessment Section Supervisor for the Wildlife Division. I'm here to update you on the department's efforts to examine our possible options uh, timeline to implement costs, benefits, and concerns from the implementation of an electronic tagging system for big game, including turkey. I'll be joined this morning with four, by four species specialists who will each review uh, the electronic registration considerations for bear, deer, moose, and turkey. Jen Vashon will cover bear. Nathan Beaver will review the, the uh, condition, considerations for deer. Lee Cantar will uh, review uh, moose registration issues and Kelsey Sullivan will uh, discuss considerations of electronic registration for wild turkey. Are you seeing the, the uh, presentation? Yes. Yes. You've bounced down to slide 24 there, but. Uh... Yeah. Down there. So, okay, so this one here. Okay. okay, so this presentation will. No. Yeah, that's what we want. Senator Dale, are you all seeing?
You're not seeing the slides? We are seeing the slides. It appears you're on slide number two. Thank you, Senator. So this presentation will uh, we'll, we'll step through this presentation by uh, first reviewing the current registration process here in Maine for big game uh, and uh, discuss the importance and use of the information that we collect during the registration of big game. Uh, we'll also examine the uh, anticipated impacts uh, on electronic registration on both hunters uh, and their, in the management programs and also on the registration stations. And we'll end up providing recommendations for addressing the management challenges that uh, electronic, the move to electronic registration will, will uh, present. Uh, that will include program costs and suggested timeline for implementation. It's not, it's not going down. I'm not, I'm not able to advance. I'm sorry, I'm not. This doesn't want to. It's going to slide you over. Maybe just highlight and click on. So Maine's current big game process is, a, is an in-person registration uh, process. The hunter must deliver the animal to our, one of our sanctioned stations. And at that point, there's information on the hunter. We call it harvest information. The information on the hunter, his hunting authority, the method, the weapon he uses, and the time and location of kill are all recorded. But you also collect biological data from the animal at this time. Uh, for example, the sex and age class and any addition, additional tissues or measurements that uh, will vary with species. An example uh, for you are the, uh, the tooth that we collect off a of bear and, uh, and moose during registration, um, ovaries and lactation as evidence of reproduction and antler measurements. And then a unique numbered seal or tag is affixed to the animal to complete the, the process of registration. And this is where the term tagging comes in. Um, we we a, a affix a tag to the animal and that provides a legal connection between the hunter and the animal. A uh, cost to the hunters uh, for deer, bear, and moose is uh, $5. Turkeys uh, we are, are charged $2 to register. And the revenue is shared between the station and the department. The number of stations were increased in two, 2021 uh, at the uh, direction of the legislature that requested that we seek to uh, increase registration station numbers to meet demands uh, last fall. As a result of our review, we added a, a 11 additional um, stations uh, for 268 stations uh, statewide. The registration process uh, is, is uh, different in varying jurisdictions. And we did take a, a, uh, a, a poll of the surrounding jurisdictions. We looked at um, seven uh, states and provinces uh, surrounding Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, New York, uh, Vermont, and then uh, New Brunswick and Quebec. Uh, most of these, employ both in-person and electronic registration. And let me stop just for a second and, and reemphasize that the electronic registration that we're speaking of here is self-reporting by the hunter, uh, not going to a, a station to do that, by, by, but by uh, reporting uh, remotely 
uh, at their, their convenience. Now, New York is an exception of those in those seven jurisdictions. It does not require in-person registration. Uh, it's all remote registration of uh, the, their, their deer. And they report a 45 to 50% compliance with that. In other words, for every two deer taken in New York, the agency is, uh, has reported to them one of those, of those two deer. So the harvest is estimated at, at twice what the, the registered um, record shows. New Hampshire does not have electronic registration, but they, like us, are, are developing a, an electronic, uh, they're, they're considering developing an electronic registration process uh, uh, this year. In-person registration is required in most of those, uh, re those jurisdictions for select periods uh, to facilitate the collection of biological data. Uh, these would be high harvest days, such as the first day of the season or during youth seasons. To look at, uh, I'd like to just take a, a, a second here and look at the, an overview of the, uh, the importance of registration data for our management programs. Currently, our registration station is acting as a one-stop shop to collect both the harvest information and our biological data at the same time. The hunter and the animal are both present at the registration station and it eases collection of, of uh, both uh, bits of information. Electronic registration with self-reporting will decouple that harvest and biological data collection and is, uh, a, a, is, is uh, a, of importance to us to, uh, in this presentation and in moving forward with our, our management programs. Biological data is critical uh, to management and it does vary by species. There are species specific challenges under electronic registration and we need to be seeking alternative methods to collect that information. Uh, most of our considerations uh, that will be presented here today are considerations of staffing and of funding. And at this point, I'm going to turn the podium over to Jen Vashon to speak to you specifically about impacts on of electronic registration on uh, bear management program. Do anything? Oops. What do you have? The notes thing? Oh, okay. All right. Yep, I got it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. So our current and our current system for registering black bears provides the department to advance the next slide. No. Did it now? Yep. Good morning. I'm Jen Vashon, state black bear biologist. I'm going to. Can you see the next slide? We're around the one that says electronic here, obvious reporting bear program impacts with the picture of the bear. Okay. Slide number six. I'm on seven on my screen. We're on six. Okay, let me. So. Let's... Yeah. We're working. Yeah. All right. Sorry about that. No problem. So our, our current system for registering black bears provides the department with information that is essential to maintaining our bear population at both biologically and socially acceptable methods. When a hunter registers their black bear, uh, information on the date, location, sex and age and method of harvest are collected 
at in-person registration stations. Also under our current system, if a hunter harvests a black bear that is marked with either ear tags or a radio collar, the hunter is um, able to submit those ear tags or radio collars to the registration station agent so that the department has information on the proportion of tag bears that show up in our harvest annually. To obtain um, estimates of the age of each harvested black bear, hunters in Maine are required by law to provide a bear tooth at the time of registration. Although the hunter is required to remove the tooth from a bear, the station provides a lot of services to that hunter. They provide them with information on how to remove the tooth and which tooth to remove, as well as labeling the tooth sample and submitting it to the department on the hunter's behalf. This harvest data is really essential to estimating the abundance of black bears in the state of Maine, as well as setting our harvest regulations for black bears. Over the last few years, the department has been working with three different universities, Cornell uh, University, University of Washington and North Carolina State to develop an integrated population model for black bears. This model sets Maine's bear management program ahead of other states uh, by integrating a variety of data to build a more uh, informed population model. This model requires accurate estimates of harvest. If we were to move forward uh, to electronic registration that is changing from our current system of in-person registration to a self-reporting system, we anticipate the potential for lower reporting rate by hunters based on other states' experiences with electronic registration uh, for black bears. Since our models require accurate information on the number of harvested black bears, as well as the number of marked bears in the harvest and the age of harvested black bears, we would need to develop efficient and effective methods for estimating the reporting rate of both um, harvested black bears and marked bears, as well as de devise methods for obtaining two samples, ear tags and radio collars from hunters that harvest a black bear each season. There's a variety of different options that we could consider if we were to move forward with electronic registration for black bears. Each of these methods um, have a cost and benefit, so we need to carefully weigh each of those before selecting the appropriate one. In this slide, I've listed a couple of the different options that we could consider. For example, we could survey hunters at the beginning of the season um, when they purchase a bear permit and ask them whether or not they hunted the previous season. And if they did, uh, were they successful? Alternatively, we could mail surveys to hunters at the end of the season that purchased a bear permit and ask them whether they hunted that season or if they were successful. Many of you are probably familiar that 80% of our bears are harvested by hunters that employ a bear guide. That also provides another opportunity where we could reach out to our main bear guides and ask them to report the number of bears that are harvested by their clientele as a way to estimate if reporting rate is lower with self-reporting. To obtain information on the age of harvested black bears, um, there also are a variety of different options that we could consider. Again, we'd have to weigh the costs and benefits of each of these approaches. We could require guides to submit a bear tooth that is taken um, by each of their clients at the time of registration. We could also mail tooth collection materials to every bear permit holder, or alternatively, we could have staff visit successful hunters, guide operations, or a taxidermist to collect teeth from harvested black bears. Because our current um, rigorous and robust model for estimating bear numbers and tracking bear population trend relies on accurate estimates of harvest, including marked bears and the age of harvested black bears. At this time, we're currently recommending that we uh, continue to remain, uh, retain uh, self-reporting, or sorry, in-person registration at physical stations distributed across the state. Our concern is that if we move to electronic registration, there's a potential for lower reporting rate 
and we would need to make some adjustments if we cannot adequately estimate reporting rates, it could affect our ability to estimate harvest um, and set appropriate regulations for black bears. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Nathan Bieber. Hello, Nathan Bieber, deer biologist, IFNW. I'd like to take a moment to discuss impacts on the deer program of switching to electronic self-reporting of deer. There are two data sets primarily that would be impacted by a transition to electronic reporting. These would be our harvest data by our, our harvest data set and our biological data set. So how are these data sets collected? Our harvest data is collected at in-person registration stations where the station clerk We'll collect data on the deer that are brought in during the hunt, such as the date of kill, the town of kill, the sex and the age class of the animal. And our method for biological data collection varies quite a bit depending on where you're at in the state. A lot of our data is collected at in-person registration stations either by our staff or contractors visiting those stations. And there are also some areas of the state where we will pay clerks at those stations to collect data for us. We also visit meat lockers and butchers quite a bit to see the deer that were brought in and collect data on those animals. And in some areas, we also do house to house visits where we'll have staff or contractors look in the registration database for deer that were harvested in areas we're interested in and try to arrange to meet the hunter at their home to collect data there. How are these data sets used? Our harvest data is our primary means of monitoring the population trajectory. So we rely on an index called the buck kill index, which is a measure of the, it's a harvest density measure or the bucks per unit area that are taken. And so this is a primary met method of monitoring the population trajectory. Harvest data also feeds heavily into a sex age kill model, which lets us look at population density and abundance. It's also important to get good harvest data coming in so that when we set harvest objectives before the hunting seasons, we can then compare how did our actual harvest weigh up to the objectives that we set before the season. Then we also need good harvest data to adjust expansion factors. Every year when we issue a, a permit, we have to account for the fact that not all permits are actually used to take does. And so we'll multiply the number of permits that we issue as an expansion factor to account for the fact that not all these permits are, are used to take does. And so we need good harvest data to inform our adjustments of those expansion factors. How are the biological data used? The most important thing we get from our biological data is accurate sex and age classing of deer. Every year when a hunter brings in their deer to the registration station and the clerk will take down the sex and age of that deer, there are error rates associated with that. So what we'll do is when we collect biological data, either at in-person stations, house to house visits, meat lockers and the like, we'll go in and we'll look at each deer and we'll record our sex and age class of that animal and we'll compare it to what the registration station reported for that animal. So just as an example, about 75% of the time if a registration station calls a deer an adult doe, it will actually be something else as determined by our staff. So it's important to know what those error rates are so that we can go in after the season and apply those error rates to our harvest data that's been reported to get a more clear picture of how many bucks, how many does, and how many of each sex of fawn are taken. We also collect some other information like yearling antler beam diameters off our yearling deer, our yearling bucks rather, and that gives us some index of population status relative to carrying capacity or how many deer the land can support. And we also collect some data that's not necessarily vital to our management, but it's of interest to the public and to us, such as antler points and weights of deer. And then we also collect lactation status data on does that are brought in as a secondary source of recruitment data. So what would the impacts on these data sets be of transitioning to electronic reporting? With harvest data, it would just be increased uncertainty about how confident can we be in the harvest data set. We don't necessarily know if reporting rates would be higher, lower, or the same by switching to electronic self-reporting, but it would probably be different. And it would be important to know then as you look at those harvests, especially after the first few years of self-reporting, whether or not the differences we're seeing are attributable to different numbers of animals on the landscape or differences in the way that the animals are 
being reported by our hunters. In terms of the biological data, this would mean that we would lose quite a bit of data in the areas of the state where we currently rely heavily on in-person registration for biological data collection. This is mostly in Northern Maine, Western Maine, Down East Maine, where we don't have the same concentration of meat lockers and butchers to work with. So a lot of the data that we collect in those areas is from in-person registration stations where we have either our staff or a station clerk collecting data for us. Just as an illustration of how impactful in-person registration stations can be for biological data collection in the different areas. Um, I've got the percents of biological data collected at in-person registration stations by each region in 2020. The take home is that in Northern Maine, for example, up in region G, up in the county, we collect about 75 to 80% of our biological data from in-person registration stations. In Western Maine and Down East Maine as well, we collect anywhere from uh, 15 to say 50 or 60% of our data at in-person registration stations. As you move further south in the state, central and southern Maine, we have lots of meat lockers and lots of butchers to collect data at, so we don't necessarily need registration stations to get our biological data in those areas. So if we were to switch to electronic self-reporting, how would we adjust? In terms of our harvest data, we would probably want to survey hunters periodically to assess what those reporting rates are. So we know that if we're seeing changes in the harvest after the season, we know whether or not that's a difference in the number of animals on the landscape or in the way that animals are being reported. And we would need to come up with a new way to issue a seal or identifier to hunters so that we can tie those deer that are brought into registration stations or rather electronically self-reported to deer that are examined during biological data collection. In terms of our biological data, we would need to identify alternative methods of collecting those data in the areas that currently rely heavily on in-person registration for the biological data collection. In Northern Maine, for example, that might mean bringing on some additional seasonal staff to conduct more house-to-house -house visits to collect data, something along those lines. Or we could do as several other states have done in requiring in-person registration, but only on some days, the high volume days to help facilitate biological data collection in those areas where it's needed. And now for moose. Good morning. Um, my name is Lee Cantor and I'm the state moose biologist. So moose registration data and biological data, very similar across species, very similar to deer <clears throat> and bear as well. Of course, the registered data provides harvest location by town and by the greater, the larger wildlife management district, and also gives you the associated success rates. Of course, registration provides the legal harvest information that's associated with having a license and a permit to hunt moose. Um, again, like Craig had said, it's a one-stop shop. So at these uh, registration stations, we collect biological data that many of you are familiar with. This includes during the bull season antler measurements um, at some locations, weights on uh, bulls, cows, and calves. Um, but perhaps most importantly, we're able to actually pull and collect the, the canine teeth for aging. Um, Maine is one of the only jurisdictions that I know of in North America that collects the moose teeth um, and does all of the cement manuali aging in-house. Um, and then during the analyst moose harvest, uh, we collect ovaries as well from moose hunters. Another critical element uh, that, that as many of you know has become much more important over the last decade is looking at winter tick counts. And we have uh, department biologists that work at the moose check stations during the October bull season. And some of us work the analyst season to collect winter tick counts at registration. Um, and that's become uh, critically important with the nine year research project we've been doing, uh, catching and uh, putting GPS collars on moose. Use and management, um, of course, registration data provides an accurate spatial distribution of where the harvest is. Also gives you success rate and of course, demographic information from our moose hunters, both resident hunters and non-hunters. Um, the tooth ages, what I say here is they describe the age distribution. 
So when we get all those teeth in and we, we do the cement manuli, we know the ages of all the bulls and cows that are harvested, not only statewide, but by each management district. And it also allows us to look at and maintain a certain percentage of mature bulls that uh, the people of the state have, have desired since the last 40 years of our moose hunt. And then of course, um, the reproductive success and the corporate lutea data from ovaries is probably the, the most important uh, element for management that we get during the uh, cow hunt. Um, I also already mentioned that maintaining a prescribed level of mature bulls and adequate reproduction is kind of the foundation of how we manage moose in the state. And uh, really both of those tooth age reproductive data are, are vital for doing some of the modeling work uh, in-house to look at moose trends and moose population numbers over time. Um, of course, if, if electronic registration occurred, we would not get 100% reporting of moose. And so just like with other spe species, we'd have to figure out some ways to estimate what the harvest looks like. And when you break that down from the statewide level of moose harvested to smaller units, um, you actually need to increase um, the sample size or the number of people who respond so you can get accurate counts. So for instance, in some, in a management district like management district 13, which has just a few moose permits, you really need everybody who harvests a moose to be able to reply and tell you that they were successful or not. So you can have high confidence in those smaller level management units. Um, you know, the end of, and all and be all is that the biological data collections at stations are the most important, and we'd certainly have to figure out a way, likely through roadside check stations, to have personnel there uh, to intercept moose and get some of the real critical information like moose teeth and ovaries um, to keep the management system rolling so we have co high confidence in what our moose are doing and what they look like, and in turn be able to allocate uh, permit levels at a, uh, at, in the best way we can. I'll hand this over to Kelsey. Bear with me. I'm going to make this wider, but may have made it more complicated. Hold on. Okay. Uh, thank you, honorable members of the Fish and Wildlife Committee. I'm Kelsey Sullivan. I'm the department's game bird specialist. And I'm gonna give you an overview of electronic harvest reporting as it relates to the turkey program and the impacts. Uh, so the wild turkey in-person registration as we have now um, in place provides consistent and accurate data for spring season harvest monitoring. So we collect date, time, location, which is town and wildlife management district, as you all know, WMD, and the method of harvest, which would be um, bow versus firearm. <clears throat> we also collect the age of turkey harvested, which is Tom versus Jake, or adult male versus juvenile male. The in-person registration system we have now <clears throat> did provide consistent and accurate data for the fall season harvest. As many of you are aware, registration Requirement for fall turkey was removed in 2021. At, prior to that, we collected date, time, location, town and WMD again, and method of harvest. <clears throat> we also collected age and sex of turkeys harvested as the fall season is at any, any sex or any bird harvest. So that would be Tom versus Jake and hen versus Jenny or adult female and juvenile female. Um, unfortunately, my fancy animation slide will not be benefited because I, it's not in slideshow mode. So bear with me with these orange bars. I'll explain those as we go through this. But um, the wild turkey harvest data for spring allows us to monitor the population similar to 
Nathan's reference to the buck kill index, this you could think of this as the turkey kill index. So over time with the spring wild turkey harvest, as shown here, 2005 to 2021, um, the harvest fluctuates either side of 6,000 by a few hundred birds, give or take a specific year. That's related to the severity of the winter and the production of the previous uh, summer. So with, very, with bird populations, there's quite a bit of variability and that's where we see that variation in that solid curve across time. Um, but you'll also see there's a dotted horizontal line which shows the trend over time. Um, we were able to monitor that and surmise based on our, the confidence in our harvest data that our wild turkey population has been relatively stable over that period of time. And so what I'll do is walk you through these orange bars. So each one represents what I consider a significant change in the wild turkey season, either spring or fall. And basically the change was an increase in opportunity. Um, so in 2007, we went to a one, one week shotgun season. Prior to that, it was all um, a bow harvest. And the significance there is that the average harvest in the fall prior to that was about 200 birds. Um, it, it increased by tenfold when we added a week of shotgun. So 2007 fall would have been 2000 bird harvest. So then we keep walking through time and our, we watch our population and see if there's any significant decrease or increase. And in 2009, we eliminated the AB season and the spring season. And for those of you who aren't familiar, the AB is referencing birth year and when you could hunt in the spring season. Odd years could hunt one week, then even years the next week. And then finally, both odd and even year birth years could hunt the last week of the five day spring season. 2010, um, saw a significant increase in um, a two bird limit in the spring. Um, we also eliminated the uh, youth permit. So we no longer had a way to track youth participation specifically with a turkey permit. 2013, we increased the fall season for shotgun to a full month. Um, 2014 was significant where we went to Two birds in the spring, two birds in the fall, all under the same permit for $20. Um, and also we went to all day, an all day season from prior to that was a noonday closure. Now we're closing it a half hour on after sunset like other species. And so we walk through time and we see the population is still remaining stable after all these changes. And then we come to 2019 where our fall opportunity increased quite a bit. In one district, we went from one to three birds in the fall. And in nine districts, we went from two to five. So just wrapping up the slide, basically our ability to track the response of changes in the season um, using the turkey harvest data with its consistency basically supported those changes and allowed us to continue to keep those in place. This is another slide. So related to spring wild turkey harvest trends that inform fall season decision. So this is specific to WMD 14, where we're considering adding a fall bird next year. So I recently went through an exercise with some regional biologists and we looked at the trend over time for the spring harvest in WMD 14. And you can see that horizontal bar is suggesting a stable population, likely we can afford a fall bird and we have the confidence based on our statewide trend that we're likely matching what the states, the rest of the districts are seeing. I do point out here, there's a circle, red circle with a big question mark. And folks are likely remember that in 2020, due to the pandemic and the risks associated with in-person registration, we eliminated the requirement to register turkeys in the fall of 2020. The significance of this slide with WMD 14, as Lee noted in, towards the end of his presentation, is when you get into these periphery districts, which is 14 is outside the core range of what we consider high density turkeys. So you'll get a low harvest. So this scale is zero to 60. So on average, you have about 45 spring birds taken in WMD 14. 
there's fewer hunters and um, the harvest is lower. And so when we, although we didn't require registration in 2020, we did have a survey that uh, we sampled a portion of turkey hunters. And because of the low number of hunters in District 14, we likely didn't reach a, a high percentage of them. So this number is an estimate based on a response rate from a survey. And I don't have a lot of faith that that is actually representative of for 14. I would say that the statewide representation from that survey is probably pretty accurate, but this could have gone either way, depending on how many people were sampled in 14. It could have been inflated or deflated and it happened to be deflated for 2020. But I still have confidence that the trend is telling us that we're likely going to be able to support a fall bird in, in 14. So I'll wrap this up with um, wild turkey, the considerations for changing to electronic registration, um, if that's the course that we take. Um, as other species special specialists have noted, the compliance or reporting rate would be something that we would definitely need to investigate. I use New York as an example for Turkey. They've been um, self-reporting electronic registration for Turkey since 2002. And you see there's a 50%, they estimate a 50% spring service, spring season compliance of reporting harvest, um, and then 42% in the fall. And this is also a good point to note that the, the effort and response rate can vary by season. And it's related to, I think, interest. You know, the spring season is more of an interest for turkey hunters in the fall season. Fall is more opportunistic. So I would guess that, that fall hunters that are surveyed or that report their harvest aren't as serious about the season and the actual hunt itself. So that's why I think there's a lower compliance rate in the fall. Um, one thing that we would do if we switch to electronic registration to measure compliance, the year before we do that, and another five year interval to see if things change would be a what waterfowl hunters are probably familiar with, but it's called reward banding, where you uh, provide compensation for reporting banded turkeys. And what you do is you have a sample of bands worth a certain amount of money. And there are um, measures out there that will suggest 100% compliance versus 80%, and it's related to the dollar value. Um, you put half of your half the bands worth money on birds and then the other half not and you make the comparison to generate what you can have confidence in the reporting rate based on near 100 percent for birds that are banded with money uh bands worth money um the other thing that we would do and, and uh, other specialists have referenced this would be postseason surveys so we'd include questions that are similar to what we ask in the registration the electronic registration age, sex, location, time, et cetera. And we, we would use that um, to compare with the electronic registration data to make a comparison and understand compliance and reporting rate. Thank you. Thanks, Kelsey. Now, after hearing from the, the various species specialists, I'd like to uh, turn our attention to looking at the impacts of electronic registration on hunters. Um, the one obvious impact would be convenience for the hunter. The ability to register an animal would now be 24-7, um, uh, any time of the day or night, and no travel would be required to complete the registration. It'd be a positive for meat care for those that are uh, normally wait until after registration to break down their animal. They would be able to break down their animal quicker because registration would take place very, very easily and, and uh, seamlessly. The, there, would be, there would be a potential for a loss of some services uh, that are, that are um, provided at the registration stations that we now have. There'd be some support for biological data submission, uh, help in, in submitting teeth, et cetera. And especially in the case of, of moose, uh, we all are familiar with the, uh, the interest in knowing the weight of the animal and uh, weighing moose at registration stations is commonplace. 
we'd, uh, as a result, consider maintaining a number of registration stations for in-person registration in the state, even with electronic uh, uh, registration in place. Uh, having done that, though, we'd have, there'd be less stations available, and we expect that it would may, may uh, extend the travel time for hunters that wish to register at an open station. Um, the moose check, in particular, is one that provides a unique cultural experience, and we know there's great interest on the part of hunters uh, for in-person registration of moose. Um, if we did, in, uh, did maintain check stations for moose in the, in the face of electronic registration. We expect that a relatively large percentage of hunters would favor in-person registration um, based on their, their past history. There would be some anticipated impacts of electronic registration to the registration stations themselves with few, fewer hunters uh, and animals being registered in person. Uh, expect there to be less income from registration to these uh, to these businesses that support the registration stations, and perhaps some additional uh, stations would close with the uh, the slower business. Uh, with station closures, we may expect some ripple effect uh, and a negative economic impact to seasonal business uh, in small communities, uh, the ancillary business that takes place when hunters visit uh, the registration stations. There would be impacts uh, anticipated on enforcement and on accuracy of biological data under electronic registration. Uh, we expect a decline in compliance with the reporting rate, but also uh, some compliance with hunting laws and rules. Um, and accuracy of, as a result, accuracy of biological data would expect it to decline. Um, and for an example, uh, I'd like to just point you towards in-person registration and think about uh, the fact that that's usually a major disincentive to providing correct information when an individual has to appear in person and uh, attest to having taken an animal. It's uh, uh, a major disincentive for providing incorrect information. Registration stations also have a value to the department through reporting potential violations. Um, they see an animal that's uh, registered on an incorrect license or have concerns about the correct shooter, they very frequently contact our warden service for investigations. I'd like to turn your attention now to a, a proposed framework for electronic registration, uh, what we envision it may look like in the state. We envision a web-based system that would use either a smartphone, a tablet, or a computer uh, by the hunter that uh, would require an internet connection. It would require hunters to have an email in our Moses, our uh, profile in our, our database. Uh, it would automatically select the hunter's license and permit from their profile and then assign a unique virtual seal number that would be attached to the animal that the hunter would be uh, directed to attach a tag with a unique seal number that was generated at registration and then it would generate a uh, confirmation email to the hunter as proof of registration and it would be no cost to the hunter for reporting uh, online. There's other considerations of an electronic station uh, uh, system uh, would be that hunters with paper licenses or those that do not require uh, a license or a permit would be unable to register electronically. They would have to go to an uh, a registration station because it wouldn't be in the system. It would require additional staffing for us for technical support to assist our hunters uh, with electronic registration difficulties. And it would, we would plan to include a uh, communications plan to notify hunters and help them with uh, adjusting to electronic registration. Uh, of importance would be the, the, the fact that it would require significant simplification of our current license and permit framework. You've heard uh, in, in the other presentations and earlier in this presentation, uh, concerns about uh, being able to identify the correct license or type of permit that the hunter uh, has as he, he shows up with registration uh, and a variety of permits that we have available to hunters. So we ex anticipate there will be some challenges as we implement um, electronic registration. There would, um, <clears throat> there in, in just to, to 
fill that out a little bit more. Uh, the thoughts are that uh, you know, our statutory frameworks uh, are, are extremely complex. Um, we're going to require ongoing training and technical support. Uh, they do now at registration stations. Our registration stations uh, reach out routinely for uh, ongoing registration uh, to the department. Um, and there's, uh, once again, the identification of the correct authority, the license or permit that the hunter has for harvesting an animal is critical. Uh, critical for us to develop uh, success rates uh, and for us to uh, uh, use in law enforcement. So a, a simplified licensing system is going to be needed to reduce the frustration by hunters and maintain our compliance rates and satisfaction by a hunter in public. A quick review of the expected cost of electronic registration uh, puts it at about $300,000 a year. System development, the development of our, our system would be, uh, is currently around $50,000 a year for development and maintenance of the system we use. And uh, we don't anticipate additional costs at this time for that, but we do anticipate lost revenue uh, due to no charge for the uh, electronic registration, about $60,000 a year. We anticipate additional staffing requirements, including technical support for additional staff to help uh, uh, man phone lines and help hunters as they register their animals. And uh, a largest uh, uh, cost would be collection of biological data and estimating reporting rates. We'd have to put more field uh, staff on to, um, to, to visit uh, houses, to um, man check stations, to collect this information. So in conclusion, uh, and, and to provide some recommendations, uh, we, we just want to quickly review that the registration process as it now stands include a collection of information that's uh, critical in, in, of a critical importance to our management. Uh, by changing to electronic registration, we will incur increased costs to collect the important biological data that we use to manage these resources. Uh, we, uh, uh, note that considering a electronic registration does highlight the complexity in our current licensing systems and that uh, a simplification is needed and is being addressed uh, uh, in, in part as you, you've you heard uh, the discussion about the any deer permit system going to antlers uh, permits uh, is one, uh, one indicator of that. And in short, simplification is needed to uh, minimize frustration by our users. Um, so our recommendation is if the legislature chooses to pursue electronic registration, we would, we would recommend that we do so in a, in a, in a phased implementation. Uh, in 2022, we propose that we uh, uh, have uh, enact changes to the antlers deer permit system. Uh, and also review the statutory framework for both hunting licenses and permits and crossbows and to and then propose changes to simplify uh, these frameworks during the 2023 session. Moving to 2024 uh, would uh, for the for the implementation of electronic registration would allow us to uh, more fully uh, uh, review and, uh, and uh, develop uh, a, an electronic process. That would uh, <clears throat> begin electronic registration in 2024 for Turkey in the spring and reinstate Turkey registration electronically in the fall season. We would recommend implementing our first electronic registration for deer in the fall of 2024. But we, we're recommending that we continue in-person registration at stations for bear and moose for the efficient collection of the biological data with these species. That concludes our presentation. Um, I think either myself or any of the four species specialists would be more than happy to, uh, to field any questions you may have. Great, thank you. Are there any questions that anyone has? Uh, Representative no. Leifert. Followed by Representative Martin. Representative Lightfield, you're muted.
Hear me now. Um, certainly, this isn't a walk in the park, that's for sure. Um, when this started out, I, boy, I just didn't see this at all being a chance to happen. But, you know, you go away from this state and hunt in other areas, and electronic uh, registration is commonplace, but certainly don't have the variety of game that this state does. And I certainly appreciate the effort and professionalism has gone into this uh, presentation. And I, I certainly appreciate the uh, conclusion very much. I, I, I like that. So I just want to make that statement. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Martin. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. As, as sponsor of the LD 1213, uh, it was obvious that some of this might be problematic. So it comes to no surprise, but great, uh, Commissioner, great uh, presentation from your staff members. Uh, section one of the, uh, of the bill, which is now uh, chapter 49, suggests that the, you're supposed to report your findings and recommendations to the committee, which you've done this morning uh, quite well. And then it says that the committee may report out a bill relating to big game tagging uh, for this uh, current session here. If in fact, commissioner, the department uh, moves forward with a bill, uh, is it my understanding that the department would work with the committee, uh, provide some advice, information and so forth? Thank you, representative. Yes, certainly um, any direction from the legislature, the department would be ready and willing to work with you to um, implement any proposed changes. Thank you. Representative Mason. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, very nice presentation. Uh, like uh, Representative Lightfoot said, a lot of complexities to this. But I, I may have been daydreaming, but you talked about the, the bandings on the turkeys and some were worth money. And did I hear right? Some were not. Uh, I don't know who presented yes. it. Yes, you did. Uh, Kelsey is here. He can respond to that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. And there's been a lot of work with waterfowl that's gone into this. But but basically, yeah, you'd just for example, you'd have 100 bands and 50 are worth, I'll say $50 and 50 are worth zero. And then you put those out there and then you compare the ones that reported that worth 50 to the ones that are zero and time in memoriam not everybody point, reports the $0 ones, but everybody reports the $50 ones. So then we make a comparison, get our reporting rate from that. And Money talks. Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, so the hunters can tell the bands what's worth money and what's not. Is that what I'm Yeah, only after a harvest. So it would just it'd be imprinted $50. It wouldn't be a different color. It'd be the same. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, other questions? I think my major concern about trying to do electronically is maybe, and correct me if I'm wrong, Commissioner or someone else, um, it seems like this would be an opportune time for poachers to increase their endeavors. I realize a poacher is a poacher, but if you look at New York and they say only 50% of the animals are tagged anyway, that means you know there's a lot of animals floating around out there that aren't being tagged. So I would think that would embolden poachers, um, you know, to be able to shoot a deer and take her on home and cut it up, and go out and shoot another one. And finally, if a warden stops them and they've still got legitimate paperwork that you know they got a valid hunting license, etc. Now maybe I'm trying to find a problem where there isn't one, but I would think that that sh could be a concern. I don't know if you want to comment on that, Commissioner. Or... Yeah, certainly, Senator Dill. Thank you for that. Um, and I'll actually ask Colonel Scott can address that question. Okay. Sure, um, we don't disagree, um, Senator Dill. A um, couple thoughts of move to electronic uh, big game registration. Um, does will cause um, some challenges around the enforcement of big game laws. Um, there definitely is a convenience to the hunters. Um, there's no question about that myself being a hunter to be able to register your, um, your game electronically. 
However, uh, game wardens have close working relationships with the big game registration stations um, across the state. And these registration stations are often uh, quite integral in detecting violations. Um, as was uh, Dr. McLaughlin pointed out, um, the agents speak personally to each hunter who is registering an animal. And through the game registration process, potential violations are often apparent, um, especially with under like false registration of an animal, um, animals killed without proper permits or animals killed in the wrong wildlife management district. Currently, our big game registration stations actually have a means to flag um, a registration immediately and send it to the warden service if they uh, detect some type of violation or suspicious behavior. And this does happen um, probably hundreds of times a year. We get flags from uh, registration stations saying that they've encountered something that they think is awry. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is the agent also physically attaches a tag to each animal, um, verifying its sex and age. Um, they're in close contact with the hunters, uh, with their vehicles, with other people in the party. And that often supplies good information to our staff um, in and around any kind of investigative information. Uh, registration stations are funnel points um, for game which has been killed. And quite often we'll have landowners uh, call up and report a violation, either shooting too close to a dwelling, trespassing, driving deer, uh, shooting from a roadway, what have you. And um, callers are often uh, only able to provide really a vehicle description and the fact that a deer was killed. When that happens, um, game wardens kind of start to focus on game registration stations with a hope to uh, potentially intercept um, the violators as they go to register their deer. Um, as you mentioned, once a person gets a deer home and realizes that they did someone detected, the temptation to have someone else register it for them may be greater than ever, um, especially because there's no face-to-face -face, um, interview or discussion with an agent of the commissioner. Um, we also worry a little bit about, um, other than even intentional violations, um, a computerized process, um, you know, very easy to have. I thought um, the system completed the uh, transaction and maybe it did or didn't. My system wouldn't connect. Um, I never got my confirmation number, et cetera. So um, Currently with in-person registrations, there's really little explanation as to why you didn't go to a tagging agent where virtually it can be a challenge. As well, um, a virtual seal number would have to be issued and there's a reason why our current big game seals click together and are strong plastic and they snap and they're hard to remove even with a heavy duty knife. I can imagine that um, seal numbers um, being lost and replaced during transportation, butchering, taxidermy, et cetera. Um, if, if, you know, if hunters are using notebook paper, business cards, or shoelaces to attach them to their animals. So there's definitely some law enforcement challenges that we, that we um, anticipate if this uh, were to take place. Uh, we will adapt and adjust like we always do, but um, you are correct. There are some concerns from that side of the shop. Thank you. Representative Ordway. Uh, thank you, Senator. One of the things that, that struck me was that if we did this electronic, that it would be 24-7. And then in the presentation, it was mentioned that we would have to add staff to be able to answer questions. Would, would we be intending to have staff 24-7 to, to answer these questions? I, I have a big concern with adding more staff for this. Do you, want me to, do you want me to answer that? <clears throat> yeah. No, we, we uh, would not anticipate that they would have staff on 24-7. And as a result, there would be periods of time when you had uh, an, you know, an individual, say, uh, midnight, two in the morning, that uh, won't wish to register a deer, would still have to wait until the following morning for that. But having staff on, uh, on the line to handle a large percentage of the the issues um, would be a, would would be required. I'm not sure if that fully answers your your question. Other questions, uh, Commissioner. Thank you, Senator. It, it, I'll wait till if they double check, there's no other questions. I would like to provide um, just a kind of a wrap up summary if the committee would entertain that. Sure. 
see if there's any other questions, like you said. Any other questions anyone has? Seeing none, the floor is yours, Commissioner. Great. Thank you, Senator Dill, Representative Landry, and members of the Committee on Interfisheries and Wildlife. I'm Judy Camuso, Commissioner. <clears throat> I just wanted to give kind of an overview of these three report backs. Uh, first off, I want to thank our staff for their tremendous work on these three proposals and projects. This was uh, a tremendous amount of work, and none of it is uh, simple. And um, you know, getting folks to come to some sort of consensus on controversial issues is never easy. So I appreciate all the work our staff did in the, on, this, on these projects and in preparing these reports. I also likewise wanna thank all the members of the public and our stakeholders who helped us with these processes. Um, there was a, a lot of time in, in folks who volunteered their very valuable time um, to help us through some of these issues. So I wanna thank everyone for all their work. Um, as you saw, the antlerless deer permit system review, the use of crossbows in archery season and electronic tagging are all interconnected and require a comprehensive strategy to move forward with any one of them. The department has developed a set of recommendations to significantly improve the antlerless deer permit system and generate revenue for the deer management fund. There are a few changes required to statute while the remainder could occur through rulemaking or policy changes. We recommend moving forward with these changes for the fall of 2022 season. So this would require reporting on a bill this session. Although there will likely be some concern from hunters, if the changes are enacted, the department would implement a communication effort and we expect most hunters would adapt very quickly. Obviously, I think a couple of the concerns are gonna be paying for the permit now, which is something folks can, you know, sort of get for free right now. So paying for something that they currently get for free. Um, also, we do anticipate some folks are not gonna like the loss of the ability to tr transfer or swap. Um, we feel this is essential if we're gonna move forward uh, with these proposals. Allowing the use of crossbows during the regular archery season has been a success, creating more opportunities for hunters with very few complaints or enforcement concerns. The increase in deer harvest has been relatively small and is not of concern as long as we continue to have an ability to closely regulate dull harvest in Northern Maine. Fully integrating crossbows into archery season would require numerous changes to simplify regulations for hunters. I think Crystal uh, Terriol pulled together a list that was about 23 pages of different statutes that this would touch. So we think this is gonna take a little bit of time. Um, so considerations include whether to require separate crossbow permit, education course, hunter orange, discharge distance from buildings, special seasons that currently limit archery season to regular bow and arrows. We, we recommend continuing the current law for two years, allowing the department to fully review these issues and come back with a bill to address them in 2023 with an effective date of January 1st, 2024. The department continues to believe that in-person registration of big game species is the gold standard and provides our staff with the best possible information to manage these species. However, if the legislature does want to move forward with electronic tagging, we believe it would be possible for us to do so with deer and turkey and still maintain effective management in, for these species. In order for electronic tagging to work well, we believe there would need to be significant changes required to our license and permit framework to remove some exceptions and exemptions. A few of these examples include the issuance of paper license and permits. Those would all have to be eliminated. Outdated contact information for lifetime license holders, landowners, and family members hunting on their own land without a license. And Lilith's deer permit transfers and swaps, tricky permits not being required for youth, seniors, or some landowners, bear permits not being required for resident hunters during the firearm season on deer, youth, or seniors. We would need time to review these issues and proposed changes that would allow the development of an electronic reporting system that is user-friendly for hunters. The last thing we wanna do is to develop a system 
that is going to frustrate our hunters and our constituents and then where they're going to the system will kick them out and then they're going to have to go to a in-person tagging station anyway so if we're going to move forward with this we want like the time so that we can do it so that we can ensure it's going to be a successful program uh, both for the hunters but yeah for our staff as well so therefore in summary we propose the following timeline to move forward enact proposed changes to the antler list deer permit system in 2022. During 2022, the department will review the statutory framework for hunting licenses and permits and propose changes to simplify during the next regular session of the legislature in 2023. Also during 2022, the department will review the statutory framework for crossbows and propose changes to align crossbows with regular archery season during the next regular session of the legislature in 2023. If the legislature would like to move forward with electronic registration implementation, it would be for wild turkey beginning in spring 2024. We would recommend registration for fall turkeys being reinstated also in 2024. Electronic registration for deer would be implemented in the fall of 2024. And we recommend that bear and moose registration continue only at in-person stations to allow for effective collection of biological data. The department will continue to work with guides to expand the capacity and capabilities to register bears for their hunters. So that is our sort of big picture summary and I'm happy to answer questions as well. Are there any questions for the commissioner? All right, thank you, commissioner. All right, committee. For all intents and purposes, we've done two presentations in two hours. We still got two presentations to go, plus uh, five or six status updates, which should only be three, four, five minutes each. But we're probably looking at two, two and a half or more still left. Would you like to take a quick break now for lunch? Uh, I think that's probably the best thing to do rather than you know, struggle through this until 2 33 o'clock and break for lunch so Special can we take order. all right let's do a lunch it's 1208 why don't we start back at 12 45 that gives you a little more than a half an hour for lunch so we'll start back at 12 45 thank you everybody Linda, should we leave and come back or leave our computers on?
<clears throat> so, Colonel, you're looking good. Uh, no worse for the wear from your COVID experience. I, I present well. <laughs> <laughs> he says as he kind of teeters and totters back and forth. Five of uh, five of the six of us had it all last week. So, if anybody, oh, needs, anybody needs to be exposed, swing by my house. And <laughs> there we go. Take care of that. We should be on the other side of it now. It's been uh, nine, <laughs> but yeah, it was. Um, Everybody at once had it, so. Wow, that's not good. We were, uh, some of us were boosted and those uh, symptoms were definitely less than those that weren't boosted. Everybody was vaccinated, but um, definitely could see a difference between that. And as well, the kids tend to be a little bit less uh, symptomatic than the adults did. So good times. Yeah, sounds it. I own one. You're on, Bob. Good. Thank you. Yep. Hey, what? That, that water looks some good going down behind you there. Yeah. <laughs> the stream. It looks pretty nice. Yep. I think you've got still, one. Of, that's a still water river. Yeah, I think you've got one of the better scenes behind us than any, anyone has. <laughs> I don't know. Allison thinks hers is pretty nice. I'm just glad he got rid of his koi. <laughs> well, I can pop him back up there if you'd like. <laughs> That's from my backyard pond there. Uh, right, right, right. Don't, don't, don't tell the colonel. He'll go confiscate. I, I wouldn't tell him so. Hey, Senator Dill, in regards to, uh, before you move on, in regards to uh, 1213. All right. Yeah. Uh, Electronic tagging, yep. Yeah, yeah the, the committee at some point in time is going to have to decide if they want to move forward with legislation. When do you, when do you want to do that? It's on the schedule for Wednesday, I think. It is? Okay. I'm looking at the schedule for Wednesday yeah. right now. Yep, it's number eight on the schedule. I see it, thank you. Yeah. yeah. And that's just a discussion to do just that, Danny, to see what the committee wants to do. Gotcha. Danny, plenty of snow up north? For snow uh, actually, actually, not a whole lot of snow at all. In the last, yeah. couple, of, last couple of snowstorms, uh, downstate has had more snowfall than we have. Wow. I've got a question snow. for you. We need snow up here for the snowmobilers. Absolutely. Mr. Dill. Sir. Uh, Hazel, didn't you? That's on Wednesday? Yep. Wednesday, we've got uh, eight or nine things. we got eight things to discuss because we're not discussing Sunday hunting yet because we haven't had the presentation. Okay. Uh, what I was wondering is I got an appointment up to Bangor Hospital and I just debating whether to go to that or go to this meeting that you got coming up. <laughs> what time is it? Uh, 7.30 in the morning, Hazel, I'm supposed to be to it? 7.50. 50, I'm supposed to be that up in Bangor. Well, our meeting doesn't start till 10, so you could certainly join afterwards by uh, phone, just, I guess. I just take the phone or take this. Yep. All right. If I'm a little late, they won't, they won't throw me out. Well, we might not let you in, but they won't throw you out. So. <laughs> All okay. right. It looks like most everybody is back. So uh, <clears throat> we ought to get started because it's going to take a while to get through this. Um, we're down to uh, number four on our list, and it's resolved to direct the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife to examine issues relating to hunting dogs and civil trespass. <clears throat> All set. And uh, I guess that is Colonel Scott again.
Sure, I'll try to share my screen. Can everybody see that? Yes. Yes, sir. Apparently, once again, my um, high definition video interactive audience participation version didn't reload. So you'll have to deal with kernel reading green and white letters off the screen again. <laughs> the, uh, um, so this is a report back on Resolve Chapter 77 um, to direct the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife to examine issues related to hunting dogs and civil trespass. A uh, quick outline where we uh, plan to go with it is we're going to review the resolve. I'm going to introduce uh, the stakeholder group, kind of give a summary of the problem, review current applicable dog hunting statutes, um, consider uh, conflict scenarios, and re recommended statute changes that the stakeholder group came up with. So the um, the resolve directed IFNW to establish a stakeholder group to examine issues related to hunting dogs and civil trespass. Uh, the stakeholder group is broadly representative of uh, interested parties, including representative of effective landowner groups, um, persons who use dogs in hunting and others with interest or expertise in the subject matter of the examination. And the, part, the department may include or involve the landowner sportsman's relations advisory board as well. And we'll report back early January of 2022. So this is a list of our participants. I'll say this is a, a, a very thoughtful group that um, participated uh, in, I think we had five or six meetings since August. Uh, a lot of uh, good thoughts and participation and experience, um, respect for each other's opinions. And I think the group did some good work and I appreciate everything that they um, uh, did uh, to work with us in this manner. Uh, Mr. Wayne Buck is a Milton Township landowner. Corporal Dave Shabbat, Landowner Relations Specialist from the Maine Warden Service. Tom Doak, Executive Director of Maine Woodland Owners. Mark Dufresne, Experienced Hound Hunter and Registered Maine Guide. Tim Farah, another Experienced Hound Hunter and Registered Maine Guide. Kara Hodgkin, uh, President of the Maine Sporting Dogs Association. Don Kleiner, Chair of the Landowner Sportsman's Relations Advisory Board and, and Guide. Bob Parker, representing Maine Professional Guides Association, as well as a, a bear hunting outfitter of Stony Brook Outfitters. Claire Perry, landowner from Liberty, Maine. Debbie Runnels, a landowner from Unity, is an experienced Maine guide as well. Uh, uh, representative Terrio was our legislative representative on the committee. And Dave Trahan, executive director from Sportsman's Alliance of Maine. So good, good group with a lot of, uh, lot of experience and thoughtfulness. So overview of the problem. Um, so this is a fairly divisive issue uh, with really a lot of real estate between the two sides. Um, under the current law, um, criminal trespass, as well as our Title 12 civil trespass, the laws only apply to people, not dogs. So uh, criminal trespass, um, going into somebody's posted property or to a property after you've been told not to be there, only applies to persons. Um, there is a long tradition and heritage of hunting with dogs in Maine. Uh, the activity is used as a component of our species management and many small businesses rely on hunting with dogs as an important part of their annual income. As we know, over 90% of Maine is privately owned, and these private landowners occasionally encounter hunting dogs on their land, and in some cases, the landowners do not want the hunting dogs on their property. Uh, in most cases, the hunters are engaged in training on or hunting for bear, coyote, bobcat, fox, or raccoon. Dogs used to hunt these species are typically more similar to hound-type breeds, which are bred to chase larger game animals, longer distances, and typically do not stay in close proximity uh, to the handler. And the work we did and uh, statutes we considered were specific to <coughs> those species of, of game animals. Um, the group realizes that there's other hunting dogs out there that hunt for things like waterfowl or upland game, um, but typically those dogs hunt and stay in much closer proximity to the handler than, than the, uh, the chasing dogs. Um, not all landowners want the bear, coyote, bobcat, fox, or raccoons on their land hunted. And they feel they should be able to restrict dogs from entering and chasing these, uh, entering their property and chasing these species. Before we move on just a second, um, Representative Leifert, did you have your hand up for a reason? Yeah, I did, Senator Dale. I was going to ask the Colonel on the stakeholder group. I see we didn't have any out-of-staters on that group, and there's a lot of out-of-state bear hunters and I'm just wondering why, maybe. Um, to be quite frank, I never really 
considered it. Um, out of state um, dog hunting uh, requires, at least for bears, requires that they hire a registered main guide. I think that they had some fairly good representation through the main guides because um, they often, as we know, that um, the um, uh, the out of state hunters uh, for bears have to hire a main guide, so they represented that at least that aspect of it well. Um, you know, as far as uh, non residents coming here and hunting, um, you know, with other folks or um, acquaintances or or with dogs, didn't really take the opportunity. I guess I thought that was important. Thank you. That's a good explanation. Okay, let me slide down and see where I was here. Thank you for that question. Um, okay, so some of these chases can go on for miles and the hunters are unable to predict where the game animal will end up. They may have no intention of hunting near a particular piece of property, but the chase ends up there due to the route taken by the game animal. When a game warden responds to a report of a hunting dog on posted land, there's no consequence for the hunter if he or she themselves did not enter the land and often law enforcement has no means to address the complaint of the landowner. Additionally, if a hunter has been advised or requested by a landowner to keep their hunting dog off the landowner's property and the hunting dog continues to enter the property, there's still no consequence for the hunter because trespass laws, again, don't apply to the dogs, only the people. This problem seems to have been exacerbated more so in the last 25 years as the popularity of running coyotes with dogs has increased in and around traditionally more rural areas which are now experiencing urban sprawl thus resulting in an increased encounter between dog hunters and landowners. So those are, that's kind of an overview of, you know, how we got to where we are, some of the facts involved with it. A couple important notations I thought it was important to highlight. One is this report back is presented as two-sided. I refer to as landowners and hunters. Um, it's important to note that that's really just a generalization for ease of reference. Um, there are many landowners who do not feel any change is necessary in the current dog hunting statutes. And likewise, there's numerous hunters and guides who feel um, and agree additional regulation is warranted. So it's not like all landowners are on one side, all hunters are on the other. It's, it's really um, quite mixed, actually, but it's just for ease of reference. I, I refer to it as the landowner side and the hunting dog side. Uh, the stakeholder group agreed the majority of the people who are hunting with dogs are law-abiding, responsible hunters who try to avoid conflict with private landowners. The group recognized that many of the complaints from landowners regarding people hunting with dogs involve repeat offenders, including some hunters who are confrontational and belligerent towards landowners. Overall, the number of complaints and incidents that we're talking about is low compared to the number of dogs on the landscape. And another important note is when I refer to hunting with dogs, uh, that includes training those dogs as well. The activities are, are virtually the same. Um, and so when we extend uh, some recommendations towards hunting, we also extend them to, to training the dogs as well. Uh, current statutes regarding dog training and hunting in Maine, just to show you that it, it is um, fairly heavily regulated. It's not unregulated by any means. Um, a person may not hunt with a dog in pursuit of bear, coyote, or bobcat, unless that dog has a collar that legibly provides the name, telephone number, and address of the owner of the dog. Person or persons may not use more than six dogs at any one time to hunt for bears, coyotes, or bobcats. Landowner permission is re required to put out baits and labeling of baits is required. So many of these um, dogs that chase these species start off from a, a strike bait or that's how they attract the uh, animals to the area. Um, you know, baiting is, is also highly regulated for both um, bears and coyotes and other predators. Uh, there's a defined hunting season uh, for hunting with dogs. Um, there's also defined training seasons for training dogs on bears, foxes, and raccoons. And there's also, as I mentioned, the representative life for just restrictions on non-residents hunting bears with dogs. So just to be clear, um, around the, uh, the accessing property, uh, dogs being on private property, it's currently fairly unregulated, but there are many other statutes regarding the regulations of hunting with dogs in the state. There's two primary scenarios that, the, uh, that we encounter here that the group looked at and considered, one of them a little bit more straightforward than the other. Um, the first one is when a hunter releases a dog directly onto posted property or directly onto land, which the hunter knows the dog is not wanted. 
This scenario is an intentional act against the landowner's wishes and the stakeholder group was in agreement this scenario needs to have a resolution. So this is a situation where there's a hunter, let's say on the side of a road, right across the ditch is uh, my property with yellow, no, no trespassing signs posted. And they point the dog's nose right at the sign and boom, start them on a track. And, you know, within five steps, the dog is on the posted property. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty reasonable to think that if, if your dog's not wanted on the property, you shouldn't put it directly onto the property. Likewise, the same property is unposted. Um, the hunter is getting ready to cut the dog loose. A landowner comes along, says, hey, I wish you wouldn't put your dog on my property. The hunter does so anyway. Um, again, currently that's that's completely legal because the dog, um, you know, there's no trespass laws for the dogs currently. Um, but again, um, fairly unreasonable and against the landowner's wishes. So that's that's the first scenario where the dog is released directly onto the property. property fairly straightforward. And the stakeholder group did deal with that, speak to it. The second scenario is a little bit more challenging. The second scenario, and this is the one that uh, garnished most of the attention from the stakeholder group and most of the discussion and, and is likely the, the result of most of the complaints that come to our department. The scenario occurs when a hunting dog is released onto the track of an animal in a location where the hunter and dog are otherwise welcomed by the landowner, or potentially it's their own property and they're um, in, an, in an area where they've hunted before. The dog takes to chasing a game animal as it is trained to do so, and the animal then runs on the property where the landowner does not want hunting dogs. So in some cases, the property may be in very close proximity to where the dog was released. For example, within a, a mile or so, uh, depending on a number of factors such as terrain, weather, historical knowledge of past hunts, and the size and proximity of the property, there may be some predictability of whether the chase will end up on that prohibited property. So for example, if myself and the deputy commissioner are gonna start our dog and we're in a, um, a bog or a flowage where we've hunted before and we have uh, permission to be there and potentially a bait and we're gonna start a dog out and half a mile up the flowage on the other side of the property, um, Commissioner Camuso owns 800 acres and she doesn't want us running our dogs on her property. You know, there's fairly high predictability that when we let our dogs go, you know, she has a very large piece of property in very close proximity they may end up there, okay? So that some, some predictability that that may be a problem. Um, and in some cases, those uh, situations can likely be avoided with good use of common sense. In other cases, the hunt may continue for a long distance and the game animal could lead the dog onto a property many miles away uh, and several hours after the hunt began. In these cases, there is limited predictability as to where a particular game animal will run once the chase begins much more challenging type scenario. The quandary is that the landowner who does not want hunting dogs on their land does not often care how far away the chase began. They merely do not want the dogs in their property. Likewise, the dog hunters or trainers really do not want to end up on property where they are not welcome. But the unpredictability of a long chase sometimes results in dogs running on property where they're not wanted. <clears throat> Again, this is much more challenging scenario and what the stakeholder agreed to that there should be a resolution to this scenario, um, but they prefer it target repeat offenders and any solution be reasonable and guided by common sense. So um, after, you know, hours of discussion and, and weighing out these two scenarios, um, they, uh, the group did come up with some potential um, statutory language or um, suggestions that could handle both of these scenarios. Uh, the first one where it's releasing the dog directly onto the property is it would be a civil violation to release a hunting dog onto the land, which the landowner or landowner's agent has personally communicated to the dog owner or dog handler that the hunting dogs are prohibited on the property. And likewise, similarly, uh, it would be a civil violation to release a hunting dog directly onto property um, posted property unless the dog handler has permission from the landowner. So again, that first scenario, if you know you shouldn't be there or that the landowner doesn't desire you there, likely you shouldn't be releasing the dog directly onto that property. Uh, <clears throat> this second scenario and potential uh, statutory language, um, again, came from a lot of thought and discussion amongst the group. Um, a civil violation to release a hunting dog so that it enters property upon which in the previous 365 days, a dog has been previously found and the dog owner 
the handler of the hunting dog or a person participating in the hunt has been personally communicated by law enforcement that hunting dogs are not permitted on the property. So in this scenario, um, you know, myself and the deputy commissioner are out hunting in October, uh, we have our hunting dog. Uh, it runs a mile or two miles or however far distance and it ends up on somebody's property who does not want the hunting dog there. We end up at the property and the landowner conveys to us that their dog is, our dog is not welcome on the property. They call the game wardens, the game warden shows up and basically issues myself and the deputy commissioner a warning that we're not to be on the property with that hunting dog, um, with our hunting dogs. That warning now lasts for 365 days. So fast forward to February, we're out in the same area again. Uh, the dog covers some amount of distance and ends up on the same property again. Uh, we would be in violation of a civil infraction of civil trespass by hunting dogs. Um, fast forward to 14 months away, the following December, more than 365 days later, the same scenario happens again. And um, um, it, it would basically start over. We'd need to be warned again. Um, so this language is um, a compromise, I'll describe it as best. Um, not all dog handlers agreed that they should be held accountable when they have little control over where their dogs will end up or what the feelings of all the various landowners across the landscape are. However, likewise, not all the landowners were happy with this either because they feel they should be, um, that hunters um, should not necessarily always be afforded a warning for their first offense and that warning should not be indefinite. I mean, should be indefinite and should not go away after 365 days. So again, this, this issue is fairly divisive on, on both ends of the spectrum. Uh, we were really trying to find some middle ground so we could help deal with repeat offenders who show up on properties time and time again um, against the wishes of the landowners um, and continue to um, engage in their hunting activity without trying to make any, um, any accommodations to see that their dogs don't end up on the private land where they're not wanted. Uh, we're not really out to, to jam up or cause problems for the legitimate dog hunter who's out there trying to do things right, trying to stay ahead of their dogs and avoid uh, or work with landowners whenever they have a conflict. Um, so those <clears throat> statutory suggestions um, are really uh, probably the most important focus because what they do is they permit um, some kind of a tool for law enforcement, for game wardens to address uh, these behaviors or the situations where these um, dogs are ending up on properties uh, time and again um, when they potentially aren't wanted there or being released directly on the property where they're, where they're not wanted. The stakeholder group came up with a number of other um, statutory recommendations that they thought would complement uh, these and also uh, potentially help um, reduce instances and, um, and serve as a, uh, as a means to um, um, help um, deal with this challenge as we move forward. Uh, one of those uh, recommendations is consider requiring a training, <clears throat> excuse me, consider requiring a permit for anyone who wishes to use a dog to train on or hunt coyote, bears, fox, bobcat, or raccoon. Uh, this permit may be revoked, suspended, or denied by the commissioner for a conviction of hunting dog trespass or other dog hunting related violations. But of course, that denial or revocation would be subject to the uh, Administrative Procedures Act. And really what this would do is kind of give an an alternative to a full hunting license suspension. I mean, there's definitely some concerns amongst the, um, um, the good hound dog hunters out there that, you know, by mistake, they could end up on a property more than once and they really didn't want to see their ability to maintain their hunting license be in jeopardy. Um, so potentially this permit would um, put a uh, kind of a, a mid-level or, or an alternative to if there was going to be some kind of a suspension or penalty put out by the department to possibly suspend this permit, it would just suspend their dog hunting activities for a year or two or whatever, whatever the time frame was. Um, if we did move forward with such a permit, uh, likely it wouldn't be required of junior hunters as well. It wouldn't be uh, required by those persons who employ the services of a registered main guide and are actually hunting in the presence of that guide. Um, you know, that's to accommodate these folks who hire a guide to go on, say, a bear hunt, and they're literally, the guide is in their hip pocket the whole way. The guide at that point is really the one who's responsible for the running of the dogs. And it's hard to, um, you know, hold a, a sport accountable when it, the, the dogs belong to the guide and, and they're supposed to be guiding them. Um, the fee for the permit will cover administrative costs and any leftover revenue could go to the landowner relations um, program for IFMW. 
Uh, another supporting statutory recommendation is to potentially require a functioning GPS tracking collar um, to be affixed to any dog which is engaged in training on or hunting bears, coyote, bobcat, fox, or raccoon. Uh, many hunters, many dog hunters are running these nowadays anyway. These dogs are, are very expensive and today's technology allows you to have a GPS on your dog and you can follow along with your GPS device to see exactly where, um, where your dog is. And this would help hunters to always be aware of their dog's location, allowing them to anticipate and head off any potential conflicts with landowners or, or other hazards um, for that matter. We, as I mentioned in the beginning, the dogs are already required to have a collar that has the name and address of the, uh, of the owner on it, um, but extending this to a GPS collar um, could increase the accountability for the, um, the hunter to always know where exactly the dogs are going. There is an, obviously an initial startup cost with these, the, the collars aren't cheap. Um, that caused some people some concern, um, but then again, um, uh, dog, uh, hunting dogs um, aren't, aren't cheap either these days. And finally, um, the last recommendation for um, supporting statutory recommendations is to phase in an online informational course required for anyone wishing to purchase a dog training or hunting permit. So if we require one of those permits, have some kind of a required online course, nothing too extensive, maybe, uh, maybe an hour, um, not unlike the requirement we had this year for the adaptive moose hunt to, um, or the requirement that we're gonna have in the future for um, people who are engaged in trapping a bear. It's uh, this hunting activity is so specialized and can uh, uh, create some of its own challenges that it's not unreasonable to ask people who are engaged in it to uh, participate in some kind of an additional online um, training or informational session so that they understand how better to interact with landowners, how um, their sport, so to speak, uh, may be different than others on the landscape and not everybody may be familiar with it. Um, uh, finally, just a chart to show that, you know, we are talking about a relatively uh, low number of, of incidents, um, but they have been growing over the years. Um, you can see the bulk of them are due to uh, bear and coyote hunting, um, you know, bobcat, and fox, and raccoons, and so forth are, are um, more or less non-existent. Uh, we just include those because it's similar activity, um, but bears and coyotes have been increasing over the years. Um, this year, there was 19 uh, bear complaints and six coyote complaints. Uh, we do know that there are some incidents that occur. We hear from landowners that they, they, they didn't um, complain about it because they seek to not um, deal with the game warden or bother the game warden, or, um, or they try to resolve the issue between them and the landowner on their own. Um, one thing that we do predict, though, is that the potential for these um, incidents and, and uh, interactions to increase as urban sprawl and kind of our changing demographic and who owns land in Maine to uh, um, continues to change as well. Um, so that's kind of an overview. I have a full written report that we'll be providing to the uh, committee. Um, that's a, basically a summary of it. Um, but those, that was the work done by the stakeholder group um, and an attempt to find some resolution to this challenging problem. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Representative Leifert. Uh, thank you, Colonel. Um, the complaints, what wildlife district manage, uh, areas were those in? Is there any uh, way to tell that? Um, they're, they're across the state. Uh, we tend to seem like we have a, a small hot spot around um, bear hunting um, over towards the Western Mountains a little bit. Uh, there's some up in the county, and a lot of the complaints uh, that have to do specifically with coyotes are. Um, more along the mid coast when I spoke to some of these, um, this activity becoming more and more popular in areas that used to be traditionally um, more rural and now um, dealing with urban sprawl. Um, I mean, I'm sure there's no coincidence that this uh, legislation was brought up by Representative Terrio and the area that, that he covers in that kind of that Thorndike, China, mid coast region. We do tend to see some increases around the, the dog coyote hunters in that region. Um, but it is it is a statewide um, issue. There's no doubt about that. Thank you. Representative Hepler. I thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm curious, are there any rules or violations for people whose domestic dogs, pets, go on other people's property? Sure, great, great question, Representative Hepler. There is actually a, uh, a statute under Title VII um, called um, Animal Trespass. 
Um, but it's really designed for like farm animals or neighbors because it, if your domestic animal comes onto my property, um, I think it's five times within 30 days. Uh, so it's one of those situations where your go-to getting out, get on my property again and again and again. Um, you can be held accountable for a civil trespass by animal. Um, we looked at that and just that time, that time period, um, it just doesn't fit. I mean, the, the chances of a, a hunting dog ending up on somebody's property that shouldn't be on five times in 30 days is unlikely. Um, um, so that, that is out there, but it's just not really designed for the, um, uh, the hunting activity. But, but our um, suggestion isn't completely unlike that. I mean, basically there's a warning-based system. You are, end up on my property, you're told not to be there. You have basically a year um, to, to remedy your behavior and not get on there again. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Mason. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, these uh, calls that you've got on dogs on people's lands, that, were there also the hunter on the land or was it just mainly the dog? No, sir. That's the challenge. Obviously, uh, if the land is posted or if, if um, someone is told to stay off their land themselves, uh, they can't enter the property and that would be a, a criminal or civil trespass. Um, the challenge with this all is the dogs are what are on the land and engaged in the hunting activity, um, but a, a no hunting sign or even as far as if, if I'm a landowner and I tell a hunter, please do not put your dogs on my property. Um, and you, you know, belligerently do so anyway, uh, there's no tool or, or law in place. And that's kind of the, what shocks your conscience a little bit. The, the hunters don't go on the land. If they did, you, we could, uh, law enforcement could clearly address that with a, a criminal or civil trespass by the person. But these are situations where the dog is on the property and the hunters are, are nearby or on the, on the road. And, and it, again, I don't want to frame it up that in every situation, the, the dogs are being put there purposely. In, in most situations, they just end up there. Um, but the landowners uh, don't want them there. But there is no violation because the hunter themselves never actually entered the property. Right. Another question, Mr. Chair? Sure. Uh, Colonel, um, what is the penalty for somebody that you've told stay off the property and they continue to come on your property? What is that penalty? So if you're engaged in, uh, so there's a couple of different types of passes out there. One of them is specific to the um, activities we regulate. It's in Title 12. It's called civil trespass. Um, and it's a, it's a civil violation. I, I want to guess it's between $250 and $500. They usually give a range. So if you're engaged in an activity that we uh, regulate, like hunting, fishing, trapping, um, et cetera, and you trespass on somebody's property, we can charge you with a civil violation. Um, likewise, uh, same situation. If you know you're not supposed to be on a piece of property, we could also charge you with with criminal trespass. And that's a class E crime in most situations, which is, I think, punishable by up to a thousand dollars. And it's, of course, it's a crime. The difference between those two is um, one of them, the burden of proof is preponderance of the evidence is 51 percent is civil. And the other one is criminal is beyond a reasonable doubt. So mm -hmm. um, it was Major Sanborn that initiated. I think it was probably 12 or 14 years ago is when we started with our civil trespass uh, law so that we are able to deal with um, folks more readily who are trespassing while engaged in our activities. Um, and typically it's a, it's a fine upwards of $500. Okay, right. thank you, sir, very much. And I appreciate what uh, IFNW has done this summer. Uh, we put a lot on them last spring and every time I called up there, I got a fast response and sounds like everything went pretty well. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Senator Black. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Colonel, and I might have missed it, but uh, you had hound hunters and guides on, on the uh, stakeholders group. Uh, what is the majority of them? How are they feeling about uh, these, these new proposals? So they, um, so the, the proposals came from the stakeholder group. And like I said, it, they're, they're divisive, but um, they, there's, there's, Everybody on the group, I think, realizes that something should be done. We're trying to find some middle ground um, because the consequence of keeping status quo and nothing being done at all, it, the issue is going to continue to come up and it may uh, cause for more regulation in the future. Um, the, the recommendations around the permit, um, around the uh, GPS collars and the training course came directly from some guides on the group. Um, 
there were others that obviously, um, you know, like I said, there's a long standing tradition and heritage of hound hunting or dog hunting uh, in the state. And so there was, you know, a, a little bit of resistance to, to move forward with some of the statutory changes, um, but they all realized that we probably need to move in that direction. Um, the, uh, everybody on that first scenario agreed that, you know, when you release a dog onto somebody's posted property, that's, that's not appropriate behavior and that can be addressed. The, the challenging scenario was that second one where um, sometimes you release a dog and it's pretty predictable where it's gonna end up and half a mile away, it's on my property. You know, that, that's easily worked through as well. Um, the challenging situation is those of us who've been on dog hunts, we know sometimes they go four, five, six miles in five, six, seven hours and the hunter ends up in a place where they completely have um, no intention of being. That's where the bear or coyote or what have you went. And now the, uh, the hunter finds themselves someplace where they potentially aren't welcome. That's why uh, we framed up that recommendation um, with the warning system so that you kind of get a pass your first time. You know, you really um, didn't mean to be there. You get a warning. That warning is good for a year. We're really trying to target repeat offenders. The second thing to keep in mind about that situation is, and I tried to remind the group of this, uh, there's many, many dog hunters out there, several of them that were on our committee um, that have really never had a negative interaction with a game warden or have had interactions with landowners and never had a game warden call on them. One thing that that warning system does is there are multiple decision points along the way where the hunter um, can remedy the situation. And when the dog first goes on the property, it doesn't automatically mean that a warden is going to be called and issue a warning. You know, the first interaction that we encourage as a department is between the hunter and the landowner to try to uh, work it out or deconflict the situation, explain to them what's going on and, and get your dogs and, and move on if that's what they want. If the, um, if the landowner does call a law enforcement or a game warden, you know, depending on the, the situation, the hunter may or may not uh, get a warning. Um, if they do, um, we move along into the 365 day grace period, so to speak. Um, if the situation occurs again, again, the hunter, the first line of defense for the hunter is to contact a landowner on their own and try to work it out. And then if a game warden gets called again, they may or may not uh, determine that a summons needs to be issued. So there is there is a lot of decision points along the way uh, that make it um, reasonable for the hunter to um, stay out of harm's way or deconflict situations. But at the same time, you know, we really can't have landowners out there who are experiencing uh, this activity on their property. And when they ask for it to cease and desist, be told um, no, and there's nothing you can do about it. Thank you. Did you have a follow-up, Senator Black? Yes, I did. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So having been a hound hunter in a former life um, and knowing that bear, especially in coyotes, can run, uh, you know, great, and you've addressed it, great distances. And the guide the guide has, you know, gone, had a dog get on a property that uh, wasn't supposed to be and, and, and uh, you know, was trying to stay off it, but it happened. And then he does everything in his uh, ability to make sure that doesn't happen. But, you know, for some reason, and, he, and, you know, he can show you or tell you where uh, or document where, it's, you know, he's put his uh, pounds onto a bear or a coyote and it, you know, ends up in that same position again uh, or multiple times. Um, is the, you, you're you're going to deal with, with the permit situation first and not loss of license. Is that what I'm understanding? Uh, that, that, that's a, that's a potential. That was kind of one of the thought processes around the permit. Again, keep in mind that, um, you know, wardens use their discretion in different situations call for enforcement action. Sometimes it's take no action. Sometimes it's a warning. Sometimes it's a summons. It doesn't necessarily mean, um, that we would even rise to that level. If we did, uh, the permit system definitely provides the commissioner with a, um, an alternative, um, method of penalizing, so to speak, or suspension, um, beyond that of a hunting, the full hunting license. However, that doesn't mean that we would never suspend a hunting license for any activity that you engage in um, and any violations. We, we could elect to um, uh, suspend a hunting license just like with any other violation 
that you could commit today. Um, but you know, the, the focus of that permit would be to um, you know, ha have an idea of how many of these hunters there are on the ground. And as well as if we needed to make a suspension, we could potentially just suspend that activity around dog hunting. Representative Mason. You're muted, Representative Mason. Sorry, I left my hand up. Okay, Representative Terrio. Thank you, Senator. Um, I had someone ask me if their dogs ran onto a posted property and they had a bear treed. What's the scenario? How do they get their dogs? <clears throat> um, so if your if your dog is on posted property, um, first thing I would do is go see the landowner and try to work it out amongst um, yourselves. Most all landowners are reasonable. And if you approach them in a reasonable manner and tell them that your dogs are there and you want to go get them, um, uh, and, and they'll often allow you to do so. Hunters deconflict that situation on their own all the time. If that didn't work, uh, you can't go on the property and get your dog. Um, it would be a criminal trespass. So you would have to call the department and um, let a game board mediate that. No different really than if you shoot and wound a deer and it runs on the posted property. Uh, your, first, uh, your first approach should be to go see the landowner and, uh, and work it out between the two of you. If you find out that, that, that that's not going to work out, then uh, work through our staff and, and we'll mediate the situation. Thank you. Other questions? Seeing none, thank you, Colonel. Thank you. Last of our presentations, an act to give the Commissioner of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife rulemaking authority to establish a bear season framework and bag limits. And that's going to be Nate LaWeb. Great. Um, this one will be relatively quick, I think, in comparison to the previous ones today. Um, good afternoon, Senator Dill, Representative Landry, and members of the Inland Fisheries and Wildlife Committee. I'm Nate Webb, the Wildlife Division Director for the Department. And today I'm going to give you just a brief update on the Department's implementation of Public Law Chapter 100, an act to give the Commissioner of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife rulemaking authority to establish a bear season framework and bag limits. And if members of the committee will recall, this bill uh, made a number of changes to the statute surrounding bear hunting and trapping. And among those, just in summary, it requires the commissioner to establish by rule an open hunting season on hunting bear beginning no later than the second Monday preceding September 1st and ending no later than November 30th annually. It reduced the fee for a resident bear permit from $27 to $10. It required the commissioner to adopt rules governing the number of bears that may be hunted and trapped in a season, which may not be more than one by trapping or two in total. Um, and finally, it provided that starting this January of 2022, in order to obtain a bear trapping permit, a person must either successfully complete a bear trapping education course or have previously held a valid main bear trapping permit. And there were a number of other relatively minor changes that were enacted by this, um, this bill as well. So just to give you a brief summary of our implementation, um, I'm gonna share my screen just for a moment to um, illustrate some changes in the bear harvest uh, trends that we have seen, um, primarily due to the, the pandemic. Um, I believe the members of the committee were sent uh, this information directly as well. So you should all be seeing a graph of bear harvest and permit sales. So um, just in summary, going back to 2005, uh, the bear harvest in the state of Maine has been relatively consistent at around 3,000 bears per year on average. Uh, it fluctuates from year to year based on variations in the abundance of natural food. And you'll see that during that time, the number of bear permits that we have sold has also um, been relatively consistent um, at around um, 11,000 permits per year. And that's both non-resident and resident hunters combined. What you'll see is that coincidentally with this bill passing in 2020 and the onset of the pandemic, the number of bear permits uh, that were sold and the number of bears harvested both increased quite substantially um, in 2020 and that carried over into 2020 as well. 
where we're now seeing an average harvest over the last two years approaching 4,000 bears per year um, with permits up over 12,000 per year in total residents and non-residents. So we believe that's due to a combination of increased in interest and participation by hunters um, that are interested in harvesting bear, as well as the closure of the Canadian border to um, US citizens, which we believe caused some hunters to come to Maine rather than going to either New Brunswick or Quebec or one of the other provinces to hunt bear. Um, so in combination, those resulted in a, a relatively significant increase in the total bear harvest to the point where we're now at a level that is pretty close to what we believe is the appropriate harvest and is um, approaching a level that we believe is sustainable. So given that um, increase in the harvest, which of course we didn't anticipate when this bill was first being discussed, we believe maintaining the current bear season framework and bag limits is the most prudent course of action. Um, we've issued a proposed rule um, with a uh, public hearing coming up on January 19th and a public comment uh, deadline of January 31st that would essentially take the current season dates and the current bag limits and entrench those in rule since they've now been removed from statute. Uh, I would also say that in terms of the bear trapping education course, that is well underway and we expect to have that available to hunters uh, later on this spring. So that's that's really all I had for an update, but I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, yes, Representative Leifert. Um, Nate, can you tell me approximately the manageable herd in the state of Maine with Bayer and exactly what we think we have right now? That's a great question, Representative Leifert. Um, as uh, Jennifer Bashon, our bear biologist, mentioned earlier today, um, we are in the midst of finalizing an updated bear population model, working with three universities across the country that sort of combines multiple sources of data. We do expect that that model will um, refine our population estimates to some degree, but we do, ex we do anticipate that that number is in excess of about 30,000 bears currently statewide. And the manageable herd is... We're, our, our goal is to stabilize the bear population at your current level. 30,000? Correct. And you think that's what it is within the state now? Exactly. Thank you. Nate, you did say that there was uh, probably because of the Canadian border shutdown, there was an increase in out-of-state hunters. Just out of curiosity, you know what percentage of the, the kill was from out-of-staters versus in-staters? Uh, yes, about, um, I believe it's over half of the harvest is due to non-resident hunters, so a pretty substantial portion. Yeah. Great, thank you. Other questions? All right, seeing none, we will move on. Thanks, Nate. Thank you. Okay, so we have uh, status updates. Uh, the first one we have on our list is uh, LD 1663, an act to improve boating safety on Maine waters. Again, that's Colonel Scott. Sure, thank you. Uh, briefly, um, <clears throat> so as far as um, moving forward with uh, LD 1663, uh, we recommend moving forward with legislation this session for mandatory boater education. Our recommendation um, would be to require anyone uh, 16 years of age or older to complete a boater education course in order to operate a motorboat of more than 10 horsepower or a personal watercraft. Uh, we would suggest a delayed implementation to give boaters a chance to comply. I'm pretty sure, I don't know if Bill Swan's on the call, but I'm pretty sure we register about 120,000 motorboats a year. Um, so if each one of those has two operators associated with it, uh, that's a lot of courses. Um, so DIFNW would begin a boater education outreach campaign as soon as the courses are up and ready. And I think that we could probably have um, you know, the latest version ready probably by the end of 2022. I hope I'm not speaking too quickly for Emily, but it would be sooner than later. Um, we would partnership with dealerships, um, the Maine Municipal Associations, uh, Maine Lakes Association, DEP, the Marine Trades Association, et cetera in order to get the word out and encourage people to start taking the course with an ultimate goal of a legal requirement several years out, either maybe the end of 2024 or into 2025. 
Uh, we think that an all boater requirement is better than a born after date. Uh, I think the original bill that was proposed talked about, you know, a born after date and it would start to target, you know, folks in that 18 to 21 year range. And as you age into that, you, you take your boater education. Uh, we see problems with imprudent speed and reckless operation in motor boats isn't necessarily a young adult or kid, so to speak, problem. Uh, it's adults who have the resources to purchase a motorboat, which is uh, uh, are very expensive, especially new ones. Um, and very often when the incident does involve a young adult, that boat belongs to a parent or family member. So we would have kind of a, um, a stepped um, um, allowance for operating boats. So the ultimate goal is to have everybody operating a boat, um, have a boater education course. Um, you know, persons 10 to 15 years old or juniors, so to speak, um, could operate a motorboat if they were accompanied by an adult uh, who had completed a boater education course. If that similar age group, say 10 to 15, had taken a boater education course themselves, they could operate a boat up to a particular horsepower. And some of these are just, you know, kind of things that we had identified, possibly 20 or 25 horsepower. So younger folks who are learning about boater education could operate a boat of a certain, a certain size. Um, persons under 10 years of age could only operate a boat up to 10 horsepower when accompanied by someone who has completed mandatory boater ed, an adult. Uh, the boater education course would have to be NASBLA approved, um, which would offer courses on, uh, we would offer courses online, similar to our current boater education courses that are offered now. Non-residents would be subject to the same requirements as residents requiring them to produce a NASBLA approved uh, boating safety card upon inspection. Here in Maine, we intend to develop a main module to complement the current course, which would highlight important issues which are specific to uh, folks here in Maine and also um, um, uh, apparent to uh, several other rules and laws that we've been dealing with in the last couple of sessions. So uh, our main module would include things like responsible boating, rules of the road, uh, what, what is headway speed, uh, imprudent operation, um, being responsible for your wake, an awareness towards paddlecraft and swimmers, uh, an awareness towards wildlife and, and our natural ecosystem, and obviously an educational portion around invasive aquatic species and concepts around clean, drain, dry. Uh, we feel a partner-oriented uh, educational approach to be critical in addressing a number of the boating-related issues we've been facing um, as the recent increase in the use of our public waterways has occurred during the pandemic. And um, I believe we're going to report, uh, present all this to you in a written full report back probably in the next couple of weeks later on in this session. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Leifert. Uh, Colonel, how would the department finance this additional expense of the training? You... Um, I may have to kick that over to Bill Swan or Emily, but once once the uh, we work with a contractor to do online um, um, Hunter, Hunter Education, we went to fully online last year and the numbers were just through the roof. Um, we hit, did the um, crossbow education course online. I showed you those numbers were up around 3000 last year. And I think what, uh, what happens is once the course is developed and we have a, a company that we contract with that puts it online, um, as far as people taking it, that really kind of takes care of itself. People get online and take it on their own. So as far as the upfront cost of, of educating all these folks, um, it's, it's not as high as obviously it would be if there was in-person courses, but I'll, I'll yield my time to the commissioner. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks yep. Colonel. <clears throat> yeah, and I, I would just add that um, the, the Colonel is absolutely right. There would be some initial upfront costs, but, um, and once we select a vendor like the online hunting course or the crossbow course that it would be that the vendor very well may charge a fee for this class. And so 18 or $19, and that would be uh, borne by the participant, not the department. Okay. Representative Hepler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I know we talked about this when the bill first came up, but this just applies to freshwater. This doesn't impact um, fishermen, uh, lobster fishermen and whatnot, right? Um. As it's written right now, um, uh, I'd have to get back to you on that. I think that we had talked about it applying uh, there, but we, there was some waivers that we were gonna potentially grant for people who um, were engaged or had been engaged and had license for commercial fishing. Um, but 
Good question, Representative Hepler. Um, I can follow up for you on that. Thanks. Other questions? All right, seeing none, we will move on to um, LD 349, resolve direct examination of issues related to operation of watercraft on waters of the state. And that is Deputy Commissioner Peabody. Is he presenting? I haven't seen him today. And I don't see him yet. He's there, just in the, the room with everyone else. Okay. Good afternoon, Senator Dill, Representative Landry, members of the Fish and Wildlife Committee. I'm Tim Peabody, Direct, uh, Deputy Commissioner for the Fish and Wildlife Department for an update on LD 349, which was a resolve chapter 45, directing the department to examine issues related to the operation of watercraft on Maine's waters, um, including how to best educate the public and specifically I'm looking at uh, potentially bans on personal watercraft. In a thumbnail, I think you just heard it from Colonel Scott on the department's perspective on how we should approach this issue. Um, that mandatory education is actually was recommended when the Great Ponds Task Force first sat and you know, through the 1990s, the results of the Great Ponds Task Force was implemented in the early 2000s. Mandatory education was one of the pieces was, that was not implemented at the time during, due to probably some of the concerns that uh, we'll have as we try to move forward now on mandatory education, that's cost, and just the term mandatory. Um, along with our report back, um, we're going to present what the legislature did as a result of the Great Ponds Task Force, again, it's 20 years ago, where they had a process for municipalities to recommend, essentially at the time, bans on personal watercraft or the operation of watercraft in general. And there was a process in place where municipalities, if they had a town meeting, if the town owned all the property surrounding, or not owned the property, but had jurisdiction within the, a particular town on a particular body of water, through a town meeting, uh, they could make a recommendation to the department to adjust uh, watercraft regulations or ban personal watercraft. At the time, the focus was to ban personal watercraft. So the that went on over a two year period um, where I can't remember how many towns submitted. I was directly involved in it. At the time I looked like Colonel Scott, believe it or not, 20 years ago, I was Colonel. And so very familiar with how the process worked. Um, the, I'll, I'll just talk about the process a little bit, how it worked and did not work. Many towns submitted. They followed the process of the legislature. At the town level, there was problems with who was allowed to speak at the town meetings um, because residents of the town were allowed to speak, but a lot of property owners on the bodies of water within the town were not allowed to speak as they were not residents. However, a lot of those people were former residents. They were on family properties, since moved out of state, were non-residents and were not allowed to speak. That was problematic, again, reported back to the department. Um, probably the biggest challenge the department had was um, we were supposed to move to the legislature uh, any of these recommendations that we supported. The department at the time did not have any metrics to essentially not support the process that was laid out by the legislature. So we passed along all recommendations from municipalities back to the legislature for consideration and essentially they were all passed. And so in our full report back, we'll be uh, talking in more detail about this process and uh, certainly not interested as a department in getting into a situation where um, people follow a, a process from municipalities and we 
are in the middle of saying that we don't support the process or we don't support the recommendation um, and essentially being the skunk at the garden party. And uh, we just we just don't want to go back there again. And but we will lay it out for the committee's consideration. And again, our primary focus will be to try with the in implementation of mandatory voter ed. So take questions from the committee. Okay, are there any questions for Deputy Commissioner Peabody? All right, seeing none, let's see. Next is. So, yep. Mr. Mr. Chair, um, I'm up for LD 626. If you take them out of order, I can stay here or I, I can wait my turn to come back nope. again. Definitely. You may as well know there's no, uh, nothing sacred about the order. So, go ahead since you're on. Okay. So, LD 626 is an act to clarify temporary mooring privileges for inland waters. Was, uh, was a bill uh, introduced by Representative Stearns. Uh, we worked with Representative Stearns prior to the public hearing and determined that it was actually an issue of floating camps or floating structures that actually created the, the substance behind 626. So uh, we worked with Representative Stearns in this committee and came to an agreement that we would come back uh, at the, to this session with a list of all the statutory law and rules that pertain to this issue of quote, floating camps or floating homes. So over the summer, uh, myself, uh, Crystal Terrio, John Knoll from the Bureau of Public Lands, Submerged Lands Division, Regre uh, Rebecca Graham from the Maine Municipal Association, and actually we had one meeting with the Maine Harbor Masters Association. We sat down and basically came up with a comprehensive list of all the statutory law and rules that really have a nexus to this floating camp or floating structure issue. And I'll just, uh, again, summarize, just under Title 12, we have Part 2, Bureau of Public Lands, Chapter 220, that has a great part in this discussion. Part 13 out of Title 12, which is Inland Fisheries and Wildlife Law on the Operation and Registration of Watercraft. Title 38, which is primarily DEP law shared also with ACF, uh, specifically the uh, statutes on moorings. Um, we have municipalities under Title 12 on the Inland Harbor Master Law and Title 38 under the Harbor Master Law itself. Um, and also rules associated with each one of these uh, statutory laws that I just laid out. Again, I, when I said part two, there's an expansive, and part 13 is an expansive statutory law across all these particular areas. When I dug into it uh, myself, just trying to prepare a report, the complexities in these laws are expansive related to um, floating homes or floating structures. Um, I quickly said to myself, which I'm gonna to present to the committee, the complexity is way beyond um, what we could do in this session for certainty. Um, I found that just for an example, the definition of watercraft um, changes in, in by, by part 13, part two, uh, various sections of law. Some only pertains to sections of law, some pertains to chapters of law. Um, that we can't basically unravel all the law that's currently in place to address this issue of floating structures. So a suggestion that we're gonna be presenting in our final report is that we look at uh, perhaps a new subchapter of law uh, or minimal section of law, probably under 
part two, which is ACF Bureau of Public Lands, where they regulate submerged lands, um, they regulate um, boating uh, waterway markings, they uh, regulate inland swimming areas. Um, some of the things that they specifically work with is, again, moorings in the submerged lands area. Um, and also a, a term that we're gonna hear more of was water dependent use. They, they address under submerged lands, water dependent use versus non-water dependent use. And I'll give you an example with, with a floating structure. Can you put a floating structure on land and have it still function as a structure? And the answer to that is yes. In fact, it's not water dependent for its use versus a swimming platform. If you move the swimming platform off the water onto the parking lot, it's pretty hard to dive off the platform onto the parking lot. In other words, that is a water dependent use. So they are already have an analysis of that in their rules. And, and that appears when you look across the country how different states have worked with it. Uh, water dependent use is an aspect that we have to consider uh, in the deliberations on this. So we'll be reporting back that um, if this, the legislature wants to regulate floating structures, that uh, probably under Bureau of Public Lands chapter, there'll be an opportunity to look at that and create some definitions. As a closing statement, the US Supreme Court has ruled on floating homes and versus uh, are they a watercraft or are they something different? And just a closing comment is the justices said that just because you can float across the water, you can float across the water on a door or a trash can, and that does not make a, a vessel that requires Coast Guard regulation. So, which you find interesting that th they said it's better suited for state and local regulation and not the US Coast Guard regulation of a watercraft. So that just shows some of the complexity we'll be dealing with. I'll take questions from the committee. Well, I spoke to the chair of ACF and he said he didn't want that bill, so. <laughs> so, so I guess this is an easy fix then. <laughs> Are there any questions for uh, Deputy Commissioner? Seeing none, thank you. Crystal, are you uh, available? I know they were having, we're having trouble letting you in, so. Oh, there you are. I told Linda I'd be coming to this computer, so I didn't need to come in on my own. Thank okay. you. Yep. Good afternoon, um, Senator Dill, Representative Landry, and honorable members of the Inland Fisheries and Wildlife Committee. I'm Crystal Terrio, Assistant to the Commissioner for IFNW. I'm here to provide just a brief update on the work that the Airboat Stakeholder Group conducted over the past few months. I'm here um, in place of Lieutenant Jason Luce from the Maine Warden Service and Sergeant West Dean of Marine Patrol because they had other obligations today. As you probably recall, the committee passed Public Law Chapter 166 last session, which did several things related to airboats. And I'll just go over those real quickly. It set a standard 90 decibel noise limit as measured by a stationary sound level test. Between 7 a.m. and before 7 p.m., it set a noise limit of 90 decibels measured by the shoreline test, with the exception uh, for airboat operators when necessary to achieve headway speed when leaving a boat launch and to get off a tidal flat. It also reduced the decibel limits to 75 as measured by a shoreline test and a person couldn't exceed 75 de decibels between the hours of 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. Again, the exception to this is when it's necessary for a boat operator to achieve headway speed when leaving a boat launch or to get off a tidal flat. An exception to all of this, um, all of these noise requirements were provided to Marine Patrol and Warden Service officers when they were responding on duty. This is set to repeal on September 30th, 2022. Um, but direction was provided to form a stakeholder group consisting of 10 people. This was done and a warden service lieutenant who I mentioned, Jason Luce and 
Marine Patrol Sergeant Wesley Dean co-chaired the meetings. There were, they were directed to do the following. One, to examine and determine airboat mechanical systems and adjustments that would result in the lowest achievable decibel levels. Examine and determine available federal or other funding to assist airboat owners in addressing any identified deficiencies in their airboat mechanical systems. And third, examine any related issues that the stakeholder group determined appropriate, including but not limited to establishing and restoring shellfish harvester access to coastal tidal areas, airboat operational techniques to allow for lower decibel levels and provide appropriate training and equipment for state and municipal law enforcement officers. From August through December, there were four to five stakeholder meetings held. Airboat testing and training was provided by Wisconsin Conservation Officer Mike Neal. State agencies actually paid for him to fly out here, um, and he stayed for an entire week in August to train warden service, uh, marine patrol officers, and shellfish wardens along the coast to help them learn um, accurate testing procedures. He also provided advice on how to lessen noise by making mechanical changes to airboats. Um, and some of those suggestions are included in, in the report that he provided, but I'll go down through those real quickly. One of them was to change the pitch of the propellers or add more propellers because it normally reduces the noise. Add an engine muffler or change the style of the muffler. Add additional rollers to the airboat trailer to lower the noise when they're loading the boat. The boat. Change the angle for the actual engine so there's minimal effort used to push the boat forward and also to provide education to any operators on ways to reduce noise during the operation. The stakeholder group, um, and I believe one of the representatives on the committee looked into possible funding resources, um, but there were no viable options found that I'm aware of. <clears throat> The stakeholder group did discuss several recommendations and conducted straw poll voting to sort of capture when the majority favored a suggestion. These recommendations included to extend the sunset date of the current law to September 30th, 2023. This would give more time to determine if the law is having the desired outcome um, because uh, when this law went into effect, essentially airboat operation was pretty minimal. That's my understanding. The season was wrapping up. So there really hasn't ha been ample opportunity to see how this is going to work. Um, second, their suggestion was to do away with the sound exemption for municipal and government airboats. But I will note that this is not supported by IFW or DMR. We still feel that there would be a need for this exemption for um, work and emergency purposes. Um, third, suggestion was to continue to attempt to secure some sort of funding for boat access sites through sources such as Land for Maine Future. Um, it was also recommended that harvesters identify traditional access points that have been lost over the years by reaching out to the landowners and possibly providing some sort of incentive to allow access once again. Uh, fourth, continue to search for a funding source to help offset costs to modify currently registered airboats to help reduce their noise. And then last, have an, ed an educational approach to the new law from both an enforcement standpoint and from an educational standpoint from IFNW and DMR, where we uh, send out social media messages and to anybody that's impacted. In closing, just to wrap this up, the suggestion, suggestions recommended, if supported by the committee, would require legislation to be passed during the session to repeal the sunset provision currently in law. The committee may be interested in discussing some type of fund to be established to help current airboat registrants make mechanical changes or upgrades to their boats to reduce the prop and or engine noise. And that is it. Thank you for your time and let me know if you have any questions. Thanks. Yes, Peter. Um, I thought this would be a local issue. Why has it gone into IFNW? Well, it's been a lengthy discussion. Um, and there are airboats along the entire coast of Maine. 
Um, we don't hear about them so much down east, but there are several airboats that are registered and operated by commercial fishermen down east. Um, it's been more prevalent of complaint in the mid coast area. And um, do you do you want to speak? No. Yeah, it's in Title Twelve, so it's it's under IFNW purview and statute. That's probably the short answer to your question. Thank you. Other questions? All right. Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. Next is LD394, an act to protect Maine's loons and other wildlife in the issuance of a permit to hold a regatta race or boat or water ski exhibition. Jim Connolly. I see him there. Yes. Good Welcome. afternoon. Good afternoon, Senator Dill and Representative Wardway. I'm Jim Conley, Director of Resource Management. So uh, we were tasked with looking at the issue of wildlife and boat races. So boat races, just to give you a perspective in the state of Maine, averaged about, there's several different types, but motorboat races have been about seven a year for each of the last four years. Then there's canoe and kayak races. Last year was 21 canoe races, five boat parades, 20 sailboat races, 15 motorboat exhibitions, and one water ski show. So the majority of the races that we yeah, Crystal wants me to show more. <laughs> so the majority of races don't really have an impact on wildlife. And so when we looked at the issue, we separated out the races by type. The other concern was that in the current chapter 13 rules, there really wasn't a provision to deny a race. So we looked at rulemaking that would, and we are in the step two going to step three, I believe this month of rulemaking on this issue, um, putting in a provision that would clearly allow the commissioner to deny a boat race and also use a person's history and, and participating in a race or the race holders history of running a race as a reason for denying a permit if we show that they were reckless in the running of that race with regard to either human safety or wildlife. The other thing is that we specifically ask for information in the application and also in the way the race is conducted that would protect people as well as wildlife. And in doing that, we've asked them to provide a map that will show that they can operate the race staying 300 feet from shoreline. Right now, the headway speed, the um, restriction that all boaters face is 200 feet. And we would look to move races at least 300 feet from the shoreline. The other thing that we um, looked at in doing this was that normal recreational boaters can operate very fast and create conditions that would create problems for wildlife. In fact, right now, when you look at the loon mortality, which was the identified issue behind this legislation, recreational boaters create the risk and the impact to loons, not boat races. I'll say that again, there isn't a demonstrated impact from boat races to the loon population. The only information that came out was there was one loon found on a race course that occurred sometime during the weekend, but they couldn't even relate it. But each year we get loon carcasses that are necropsy where recreational boaters have struck loons and caused mortality. And that creates a very emotional context for people because they look at it and say, well, fast boats kill loons. Well, fast boats run by reckless people who aren't observant can kill a loon. But there isn't the history or the uh, record to show that that is what's occurring in races. But we've put in place uh, rulemaking language 
that allows us to monitor the issue. So we ask first that the applicant provide us information that they can run the course, staying 300 feet from the shoreline and avoid all the safety hazards. So they provide that map that shows where loon nests are and information on the loons on a pond, uh, but also any safety hazards. We also ask that they have two spotters during the course of the race that have communication with the participants in the race and that they are prepared to stop the race if they observe any kind of intrusion into the race course, either by wildlife or by people. And that's their responsibility. We're also asking for two plant inspectors to inspect boats coming on to make sure that they aren't bringing any invasive plants on or off the pond. So they're inspected before or after. What we've tried to do is look at the other language we have for other things like bass tournaments and create a consistency between them. So there isn't some focus on boat racing that isn't consistent with how we look at other activities that are occurring on ponds. The other thing is that we've looked for a specific on-site manager of the race, a person who's responsible for that activity. And then we ask for a follow-up report after the end of the race so that we know that <clears throat> what's happened and can then use that information in evaluating the, the race event for the following year. We also ask for advance notice in the community so that people that have information or an interest can participate. And then it's clear in the rule that all of that information will be used to evaluate whether we grant a permit or not. So that initial concern about will you ever deny a permit is clear. The commissioner in rulemaking is establishing that that's the department's responsibility to do that and that that information will be used to evaluate whether the race should be held and uh, or whether a permit would be issued in the future. <clears throat> Again, the real concern is that fast boats can kill loons, but the record shows that it's recreational boaters, which ties into our concern and interest in having mandatory boater education. That's really what we're looking for, and that's where the issue is. The race boats that are happening, the motorboat races, are being run by people that are very concerned about that. The size of the boats could be impacted catastrophically by encountering a loon. There isn't a history that that's ever occurred. But when you look at the, uh, the physics and the, and the engineering, and you look at the size of the boats and the speed, even a small strike would be catastrophic they have a great interest in conducting the course responsibly. And then when you look at the extent of the problem, when you're talking about seven races a year at this point in time, primarily on one water body, um, recently it's expanded to a couple others. For motorboat races, there isn't that huge problem. But what we've tried to do is put in place a reasonable balance of regulation with an onus on the holders of the race and the participants to behave responsible, and then accountability back based on that history and that practice, and also based on the information for loons that's provided in wildlife on the pond, we'll have a chance to evaluate whether the race should occur in the first place, and over time we can use that information to fine tune and, and work with the race holders to steer them to places where there isn't a problem, if a problem is demonstrated to occur in the first place. So that's the approach that we've taken. Um, and if anybody has any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Are there any questions? All right, seeing none, thank, thank you. Uh, Commissioner, did you wanna say anything at all about uh, Sunday hunting before I know you want to do it later, but uh, go ahead. Sure, thank you, Senator Dill, Representative Landry and members of the committee. Again, I'm Judy Camuso, Commissioner of Fish and Wildlife, and I'm just gonna give you a real brief update um, on our progress on uh, Resolve uh, 107 LD 1033. So as you recollect, the committee directed the department to 
convene a stakeholder group to look at potential for Sunday hunting. Um, we have done that, I think, successfully. Um, we convened a group of large landowners, small landowners, uh, uh, hunters, non-hunters, recreational users, as well as representatives from different parts of the state. And we hired a facilitator, um, Carol Martin, who did a wonderful job getting the group to consensus on the goals of the stakeholder group, as well as um, the process moving forward. So we had about four or five meetings of the group and we did hire a survey firm, responsive management to conduct the survey and uh, write the questions for us. This is a firm that we as a department have used many times. They've done our big game plan, our fur bear, fur bear plan, our fisheries management plan. Um, they have one of the most respected uh, natural resource survey firms in the country. Um, and so that you probably remember Mark Duda spoke to you all a few years ago. Uh, it's his firm that conducted this survey. We were able to, um, I guess I, I will say consensus, got the group to consensus on the questions that the survey will ask. So um, we don't know what the survey results will be, but um, the questions have been agreed to by uh, all members of the committee. So I think we have consensus on the questions as well as the folks being surveyed. The survey will go out to just about 2000 people in the state and that will include a portion of uh, hunters, the general population, and then people in northern, western, southern Maine, as well as uh, landowners and, and a small segment of large landowners as well. So it will be a really uh, thorough review. The questions, the survey is, has been deployed. They're in the process of compiling those right now. We anticipate we will have uh, a full report or, or the survey will be completed in the next week or so. And then we will be reviewing um, the report back from the responsive management from the survey firm. We will convene the stakeholders once more to share the results of the survey with them. And then ultimately give a presentation to you all, hopefully uh, mid, mid February, mid to late February. I'm happy to answer questions, yeah. Representative Leifert. Um, Commissioner, um, this seems to partly be a out of state uh, issue. Did we have any out-of-staters on that uh, stakeholder committee? Um, we didn't have any representatives from out-of-staters, although it, it's mostly an issue that the residents here in Maine uh, have been pushing for because most states, most other states do have Sunday hunting. And so there's some concerns that folks from other states don't come to Maine because we don't have Sunday hunting here. So. Uh, but the survey itself will actually include a portion of the people surveyed will be from out of state so that we could certainly answer the question on how how those folks and we'll be able to stratify that or pull out the responses from the portion of the respondees from out of state. So we did certainly talk about that and we talked about the economic impacts that, you know, uh, non-resident hunting provides. And so we certainly talked about that representative. Um, and I think we'll be able to address any concerns uh, in with the results of the survey. Thank you. Representative Hepler. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. This actually isn't a question as much as a comment. As someone who just participated in her first stakeholder group, I would gladly do it again. And <laughs> it was um, the facilitation, the, the information that came across, um, and the, the person that they hired worked really well because there were diverse opinions. As, the commissioner said, so thank you. Thank you, Representative, for your help too. Other questions? All right, seeing none, that is all that we have scheduled for today. Um, on Wednesday, again, we will uh, meet at uh, 10 a.m. And we have, I believe, eight of the discussion points that we went over today. Um, we will be talking about to see what, how we want to proceed. Many of them are work carry over bills. Um, some may just be resolves and we can report out bills. Um, so um, be thinking of that. Uh, the commissioner said that they'd be sending us information from today's presentation. So we'll have that at our fingertips to look at. And uh, with that, I see Representative Leifage, you have your hand up. 
Uh, thank you, Senator. I got called away on the uh, airboat. What was the LD on the airboat? Uh, well, it was actually this, uh, it was chapter 166 or LD 166 from last year, but we have a new bill this year that's LD 1873 too, so. Thank you. Yep. Are there other final questions? Seeing none, can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. It's been moved, is there a second? All in favor, none opposed.